Hi there, football fans. It's National Pro Highlights time again. And look at that snow. Hmm. Join me for a trip around the circuit for all the big National Football League games. Over. The most exciting new development on the American sports scene came to life in 1960 with the birth of the American Football League. Damn it, beside him, Woo! I got news for you. We're going to win the game, I guarantee. This has got to be one of the greatest football games I've ever seen, Paul. Hey, never club one on them. This is the story of a love affair. The story of the Denver Broncos and their days in the American Football League. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you got to get it done. Somebody from the CIA came to speak to us because they were looking for secretaries, and I actually was accepted to work for the CIA, and had a date to go to Washington, D.C., and a friend of mine called and said, there's a new football team in Boston. And I called the Boston Globe, got the name of the general manager. General Manager Ed McKeever is an old hand at football problems. Anything from getting a new player to flying the team all over the country. And as part of the interview, he put out a piece of paper and put 11 circles on the piece of paper and said, this is the offense of a football team. Name the positions. And I put the tackles next to the center and the guard should have been next to the center. And I thought, well, that'll be it. Two days later, he called me and said, would you come to work for the Patriots? So I started in June of 1960. Joan Parker's is the voice you may hear when you call Congress to 1776. Our house was set up the way our antenna was turned to ABC and NBC. So I used to have to beg my dad, let's go up on the roof. Let's turn the antenna so I can see the CBS Eagles game at the Cardinals or wherever they were. It got to be too much of a chore. And my dad convinced me just, you know, watch the other channel, ABC, uh, there's a game on there. Houston now is in the midst of a 40-yard drive. The thing that drew me towards it were people like George Blanda, Billy Cannon. They get it to Cannon. He got the pin. Then it became less important to watch the Eagles. I remember growing up in Annapolis and sitting on the floor, black and white TV, of course. After watching the first game, either the Redskins or the Colts, then the second AFL game would come on. You know, it, it was a way to spend the rest of the Sunday afternoon and a way to postpone homework. At the time when the AFL started, I was like, you know, 22, 23 years old. A lot of guys that were playing were friends of mine. I mean, guys that I played in college with or guys that I played against. That's what the AFL was initially, more opportunities for players to play. And then as I started in coaching, there was more opportunities for coaches to coach. I never forget the first meeting we had in 1960. I said, listen, I do not know how long the American Football League is going to last, but I'm going to guarantee you this. We are going to be the winningest team in the history of the American Football League. Write that down and underline it. The only history book that concerned the founders of the American Football League was the one they were writing. Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys. One that offered a perfect reflection of its time. How fitting that it began on a jet ride through dreamy clouds above a fruitful nation in the hand of a humble man not yet 30 who believed the old way was not the only way. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done. His words were quiet and measured. His league was sound and fury. His name was Lamar Hunt. This story belongs to all the people whose lives he changed forever. I think probably my mother must have been bitten by a show business bug when she was pregnant with me because uh, that's just something that's of interest to me. I love show business. I love working on how do you attract the public to buy a ticket. Well, certainly Hunt was one of, the, one of the first sports entrepreneurs, as we would call them now. 
you had a notion of sports as an entertainment business that preceded most of his peers. You know, this was a guy who jumped to the AFL from a failed venture in miniature golf franchising. A bogey of a business plan wouldn't hurt Lamar Hunt, who at any point could have chosen to fall back on his family's oil fortune. What pumped through Lamar's veins was his love for the spectacle of sport. At age 26, he watched the NFL title game on television. Barking out the signals for the Baltimore Colts. There, in a black and white image, he saw a full color future in professional football, a growing game in a nation coming of age. The late 50s were a time of tremendous growth. There was more free time, there was more money, and America is moving out to the suburbs, and they are starting to enjoy the spoils of victory in two world wars. As all this is happening, the owners of the NFL weren't really interested in expanding. They had stuck together through a world war, through a challenge from the All-American Football Conference. Now that the pie was finally getting larger, they weren't really interested in giving somebody else some pieces of it. There's no excuse for expansion in the National Football League. We furnish football now for free through television. Expansion can only weaken the personnel. Lamar Hunt wanted an NFL franchise, but the owners of the NFL told him the NFL wasn't going to expand. The only way he was going to get into the league was to buy a franchise. And the only franchise that was even considered to be for sale were the Chicago Cardinals. And he goes down to talk to the owner of the Cardinals in Miami, Walter Wolfner and at one point, Wolfner boasted, look, Bud Adams down in Houston wants a team. There's people in Denver. There's people in Minneapolis. All these places want an NFL team. I don't need to deal with you. So Lamar Hunt shakes his hand, gets on a plane from Miami back to Dallas. And then the thought occurred to me, and it was literally like a light bulb going off. Hey, if all of these people, me included, want to have teams in a new league or in, in pro football, why wouldn't a new league succeed? I asked myself that question, and then I thought, well, it will. He gets some airline stationery and etches out the plans for this new league. This is how many teams, this is what the schedule's like, this is what the budget's going to be like. And then, typical of Lamar Hunt, he gets this great idea and tells nobody, and spends the next few months just very studiously, very carefully planning out how he's going to begin this new football league. A new league was the least of the NFL's problems. Congress wanted NFL Commissioner Burt Bell to explain why his league should not be prosecuted as a monopoly. So when Bell learned of Hunt's plans, he decided it was time everyone knew about the budding American Football League. And he asked if he could announce our league in these hearings. Now, he was doing it to get some heat off of himself. They were wanting to know, why isn't the NFL expanding? And so I said, well, sure, you go ahead and do that. And, and it got enormous attention because Burt Bell, in effect, announced that there was going to be a new league. Well, that was a lot better than having Lamar Hunt announce there was going to be a new league. The most exciting new development on the American sports scene came to life in 1960 with the birth of the American Football League. Teams at New York, Buffalo, Boston, Denver, Oakland, Los Angeles, Dallas, and Houston. I was in the locker room with Cleveland Browns when Paul Brown got up and said, there's a new league starting. Don't pay any attention to it. It's not going to succeed. It's bunch of sons of rich guys that, you know, don't know anything about football. Everyone in the National Football League took a uh, pretty much negative attitude towards the new league. But underneath all of it, I thought it would give us a chance to get higher salaries because now we had competition for the NFL. Before that, the only place we could go was to Canada. <laughs> we had no leverage because I didn't want to go to Vancouver or somewhere. The NFL was paying attention. Its owners made Hunt and Houston's Bud Adams an offer. Abandon your plans for a new league, and you can each have an expansion franchise in the old one. When both Texans refused, the NFL changed its approach. 
In late August, Lamar is back in Dallas, and he gets a call on a Saturday afternoon from Associated Press reporter who wants to ask him uh, if he's got any response to the news out of Houston. Suddenly, the NFL, which had no interest whatsoever in, uh, uh, in expansion, started a franchise in Dallas, Texas, which happens to be where Lamar Hunt has his team. They also stole one of the AFL's planned initial franchises. You can order your tickets now from the Minnesota Viking ticket office. Minnesota was to be a part of the AFL, and the NFL turned around and offered that same owner group an uh, expansion franchise in the NFL. I think at that instant, Lamar Hunt realized he was now in a fight. They were going to try to destroy the AFL before it could start. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. It seemed an almost impossible feat. We're going to go to the moon? Yeah, and I'm going to become the Dalai Lama. I mean, <laughs> we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It was communicated loud and clear. We can do, collectively, almost anything if we set our minds to it. This was an age of daring. America would shoot for the moon. The American Football League would aim for the NFL and do it with a former fighter pilot as its commissioner. Most people thought it probably should be a football figure. Of course, Joe Foss was a person of significant national prominence. He was one of the great heroes of World War II. He was a Marine Corps pilot, knocked down 26 Japanese planes. He was a big, good-looking guy, been the governor of South Dakota. Questioning went along these lines. Have you ever played football? I said, Oh, yes, I played in college. Well, have you ever coached? And I said, my coaching was fighter pilots. If you lost, you got killed. But uh, I don't think you really want to coach. What you want is somebody that can open every door in the United States. And I have the confidence that I'm the guy that can do that. And Lamar said, say, are you interested in a commissioner's job? The commissioner of the American Football League, Mr. Joe Foss. Let's welcome Mr. Joe Foss. He had energy, he had charisma, he had drive. People would call the league offices and the secretary would say, oh, Commissioner Foss is en route. That meant he was flying his own plane somewhere. I traveled 250,000 miles that first year. I went to all the training camps. I think there were only a half a dozen guys that could do more push-ups than I could. Almost 500 push-ups. He would go around and make speeches to this chamber of commerce or this group of Shriners and talk up the American Football League. He was an outstanding representative for the American Football League and carrying our story to the American public. This is it. We'll let the ball players do the talking today. Merry Christmas to you all. The league fell like a gift from the sky into the lives of men like Paul Lowe. After the NFL's 49ers cut him, Lowe was employed in the mailroom at Baron Hilton's charge card company. In 1960, Hilton founded the AFL's Los Angeles franchise. Naturally, the credit card man named his team the Chargers. When Hilton heard of the potential talent in his mailroom, Lowe went from sorting letters to reading fan mail and became the number two all-time rusher of the league that wanted to make football fun. times I just think of, uh, you know, where I would be in life right now had it not been for the American Football League.
My name is Buster Ramsey, and I've come to coach the Buffalo Bills. What do you say? Let's get started. Let's talk about humble beginnings. When we watched films, we would hang up a sheet, a white sheet, and we would sit on milk cartons, and we would watch the films, then we'd go out on the field and practice. In the AFL's early days, some teams were a bit threadbare. Denver couldn't afford to outfit its players, so practice gear was strictly BYO. The game uniforms they were given were UGLY. Mustard-colored jerseys with chocolate brown pants and those vertical striped socks that we wore. People would laugh at you. They would make, they said, we feel sorry for you. But y'all have to wear stuff like that. You can't see the striped socks in this footage of the AFL's first game, but watch closely and you'll see Denver's Al Carmichael scoring the first touchdown in league history. At the start, the new league wasn't always easy on the eyes, whether it was the uniforms, the game films, or stadiums like the dilapidated polo grounds. Home to coach Sammy Ball's New York Titans. That damn worst damn place I ever saw. It had been run down. They didn't clean it up or anything. Made me sick just to go out on the field. I've seen all the big cities I want to see, and it's all because of New York. I'm a country boy, and I like the country. If I want to walk out in the yard and take a leak, I'll walk out in the yard and take a leak. To make its grass greener, the AFL needed all the help it could get. I had to go to Dallas, Texas, July the 1st of 1960, and we had 129 guys there. And I noticed at the end of practice, there was a guy come out there every day, and he would water the field. Later, I found out it was Lamar Hunt. These players have got the choice. For the first time in, I guess, 10 years, they have a choice of where they can go play. Lamar Hunt's humility impressed everyone he met, sometimes in stark contrast to the NFL's approach. Pittsburgh drafted me in the NFL. Buddy Parker was a guy, him and Bobby Lane came to my house, drunk. Was on my front porch about 5.30, woke me up. So we gonna draft you this morning. They were so drunk, they were holding each other up in front of my house saying, the hell with that NFL. I don't think they knew my dad was a minister. He went out front. He said, well, you up. My dad was a big old black guy. He talked with a deep voice. You won't be going to Pittsburgh. I said, yes, sir. The Reverend Haynes was far more impressed when he met Lamar Hunt. And so Abner signed with the AFL's Dallas Texans. Signing players was just part of Hunt's effort to build a team that could battle the rest of the AFL on the field and that off it could compete with the NFL's Cowboys. I took a trip to Dallas, slept in a prince's palace. In the early 60s, Texas was known nationally as sort of a place for millionaires, entrepreneurs, big spending, big hats, big hair. A lot of people driving around with Cadillacs with big fins. Suddenly, in 1960, uh, there's two professional football teams appear out of nowhere in Dallas. And you pretty much picked. Injuries impaired the Cowboys' offense, but they still managed to hold their own against the toughest competition in the world. The Cowboys were from the lordly NFL, and they definitely didn't feel like they had to stoop to, to sell tickets. The AFL, they felt like people have to know who we are, so they did almost anything. Lamar Hunt, for being as unassuming as he was, loved show business. And he billed his team as the Zing team of pro football, Z-I-N-G. One of the highlights of the Texans games this past season was the best halftime in professional football. 
featuring the fabulous Dallas Texans, and now meet Miss Dallas Texan of 1960, the beautiful Miss Kay Sutton. The Cowboys played some games on Friday nights. The Texans would often have a promotion that if you bring a ticket stub from Friday night's high school football game, you get into Sunday's Texans game for free to get the crowd away from the Cotton Bowl on Friday night and going to their high school game. And then that was the, that was the level at which the war was fought. Cowboys' first three years were bad. They're playing in the established league. They've got the name stars showing up to the Cotton Bowl, but they're losing week in and week out. The Texans have this young team, this exciting team, Abner Haynes, playing this dynamic brand of football. to December, the American Football League race was a hectic and exciting one. We feel like December 1961 will find the American Football League championship resting in the hands of the Dallas Texans. Tom Landry admitted to me years later the Texans would have beaten us. It would have been a headline back then. It would have been huge news for the Cowboys to admit that the Texans were better. Down the road from Dallas, the AFL's Oilers were the only pro football team in Houston. From the start, Houstonians had as much pride in their team as they did in their city. Houston was under, at that time, the shadow of Dallas. They thought of Texas, well, Dallas is sort of the big city there. He said, wait a minute, Dallas is barely a Texas city. This was our attitude. Because Dallas is the only place in Texas that looks north and east for approval. We don't look for approval any damn person. We know we're big league, but the rest of the world doesn't know it, doesn't believe it. Well, when the first talk began that professional football, professional football, might be coming to Houston, uh, it spread like mildew in a dark basement. This was going to be a stamp. Houston is big league. It's now not just a big town, also, it's a big city. I don't think it's an overstatement to say it was the biggest news since uh, the end of World War II. In the boom town of Houston, pro football began with a bang. It came when Oilers owner Bud Adams doubled the offer that the NFL Rams made to college football's most explosive player. Cannon is the only guy I can think of before Namath that really had that kind of, uh, you know, marquee name. So, Billy, the Atomic Cannon, it is my privilege to present to you the Heisman Trophy for 1959. Signing Billy Cannon was part of the Oiler owner's master plan, to win points with his fans by scoring them on the field. Bud Adams had the idea that uh, in the early days, good defensive backs and good pass coverage would not be in existence. So they did build their team around offense. Billy Cannon out of the backfield, Charlie Hennigan, you want a good uh, statement about Charlie Hennigan, call, call Willie Brown. Willie is in the Hall of Fame, as good as defensive back that ever lived, and he had to cover Hennigan in practice, couldn't cover him. They traded him, actually, to Denver. So now we go and we're playing Denver, and Charlie Hennigan's the last game of the season. He needs nine catches to break the record of catches in a season. And Willie Brown has covered him. We had eight passes the first half. Charlie Hennigan, Landers receiver here, caught 101 passes, a pro football record. Directing the Oilers' offense was George Blanda, a backup quarterback and place kicker discarded by George Hallis and the NFL's Bears. Out of the game in 1959, grateful for a new football life in the AFL. There were a lot of players that came from the NFL that wanted to show the NFL that they made mistakes. And George was one of those guys. You know, sometimes we think, you know, we get carried away with, he wanted to show George Hallis. Well, a lot of people want to show people, but they don't have what it takes to do it. George had what it took to do it. 
we're back deep in our own territory, and I could just feel on this particular down that they were going to bring in the linebackers and maybe even a safety. So uh, I called full protection, and we isolated Billy Cannon on their free safety. He swung out of the backfield, and they weren't going to catch him. Houston's offense carried it to the AFL's first two titles. Gus Grissom is teeing up the ball as the honorary referee, George Blander, shakes his hand. One of our great astronauts to a station here in our space center in Houston. The city that was home to the U.S. space program was also the launch pad for the AFL's first great air show. To its big-time team, Houston had an undying devotion, come hell or high water to the Gulf Coast. Playing Oakland in 1961, and a hurricane was fixing to come in. It was a Hurricane Carla, if I remember right. Did quite a bit of damage around here, but we had a full stadium that night. I remember Charlie told us, as a matter of fact, uh, and that story is true, that if you had tickets to an Oilers game, never mind a hurricane is coming ashore. The game is going to be played, and damn right, we'll be there. The Weather Bureau here has the radar, that 250-mile range radar, is probing out in the Gulf. Such pictures are now very common, but in those days, to see this monster, I said to myself what you would have said to yourself. Television is pictures. This is a picture. Nobody's ever seen this on television. There is the eye of the hurricane right there. You can see it very clearly on the radar, a beautiful picture. Television weather coverage changed that weekend. Every day it became clearer. America's newest force of nature was television. It was an engine for information, and if harnessed correctly, a machine to make money. That lesson Lamar Hunt learned from the sport that at the time dwarfed even the National Football League. Lamar Hunt had been spending much of 1958 trying to decide, does he want to invest in baseball? Does he want to invest in football? And he actually went to a, a meeting that Branch Rickey held. And one of Rickey's concepts, which he'd gotten from Bill Veck, was the idea of sharing television revenue. Because Bill Veck had made a big stink about that, saying that it was unfair that the Yankees should get all this money for the broadcasts in New York when the Cleveland Indians, who Veck owned, were an equal partner in those games and should share equally in the revenues the Yankees were enjoying. He was branded a socialist for even making the suggestion. But Lamar Hunt understood in a way that not many people did at the time, that this was not an economic question. It was a competition question for franchises in smaller cities to compete with the New Yorks and Los Angeleses. You had to equalize the television revenue enjoyed by those teams. And so one of Lamar Hunt's main points was each team shares equally in a league-wide network package. First, the AFL needed a network. Just months before the league's 1960 debut, it found one in ABC. The deal was negotiated by New York Titans owner Harry Wismer, a former broadcaster who knew how to put on a good show. Good evening, everyone. This is Harry Wismer, inviting you to join me on the 50-yard line of the nation's professional gridiron. As we... He was a famous radio announcer out of the 40s and 50s, and a unabashed promoter, you know, a tub-thumping kind of guy. Nothing wrong with that. He was somebody who would, at the Waldorf Astoria, be milling around the lobby and then sneak off to a payphone to call the front desk at the hotel and ask to have Harry Wismer paged. And someone would assume that something important is going on with Harry Wismer again. Who's ever heard of a, uh, of a Titan, number one? And of course, Wismer knew what it was all about. The Titans are bigger than Giants. And he wanted something that was perceived as being bigger than the New York Giants. Well, you know, I hate to disillusion him, but uh, there's nothing bigger than the New York Giants were back in those days. The Giants would be in Yankee Stadium, and we'd be at the Polo Grounds, and a lot of people would come over and park their car in the parking lot at the Polo Grounds, and then they would take the subway back over to Yankee Stadium. So the parking lot crowds were a lot bigger than the stadium crowds. I was able to go up and shake hands with everyone that was there 
and congratulate them on coming to the game. About half of them said, no, I'm here on a comp. And I said, well, just to get you started, bring a paying customer next time. Mr. Wisberry really thought we were going to have an average crowd of 40, 50,000 people. And when that didn't happen, he was on such a short budget that he just couldn't function. Here's Frank Gifford, all pro halfback. Hey, Joe, are you still using that greasy kid stuff on your hair? What else? Vitalis. The Giants were doing television commercials. That's it, rub it in good. And we were lucky if we could get a dry, clean towel. And then try Vitalis. So Harry tried a novel technique to refinance the team. He married the widow of a former Newark hoodlum named Longies Wilman. Longie had gone water skiing in the Passaic River with lead skis and, of course, died. <clears throat> and it was assumed that Mrs. Wilman had quite a stash of Longie's money. Now, it turned out Mrs. Wismer, or Mrs. Wilman Wismer, didn't really have a stash of money, but we were kind of hopeful, actually. That's how desperate we were. We didn't care where the money came from. <laughs> this afternoon, folks. It was hard playing football, the kind that you came to see. We hope that you enjoyed it, and it was a pleasure refereeing a game where people wanted to see a good football game played under the ideal conditions that we play under in the American Football League. Thank you. I seem to maybe be the only one in my group of peers that was talking the league up. They were hearing and reading things about uh, how it was a second-rate league, how players who played in it were second-rate as well. I actually almost felt that it was mine in my neighborhood because nobody else was interested in it. I'm not sure if my father even listened or watched the Patriots games and his own daughter was working for them. Everybody I knew knew they were a football team. I'm sure they couldn't name two or three of the players. And so uh... We had here a league who had players, Billy Cannon and some others who were known, but most of them were not known. We had to somehow get people caring whether they watched the games or not. I mean, everybody cared if the Giants were playing the Bears. We spent a lot of time trying to personalize some of these players. First of all, what they looked like, and secondly, what kind of people they were. And so we started weaving interviews and things like that in. Hi, Freddie, Fred, 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 the tight end for the Dallas Texans. It's also why we started supering their names. We were able with the AFL, because it was brand new, to do some things that we probably couldn't have done if we had had the NFL at that time sound. Nobody ever heard the sound of a punt or a contact of lines and things. So we developed these mics so that you could pick that all up. Have only nine seconds. The American Football League increasingly was becoming a must-see TV, particularly for those who were not dead in the world football fans. It was uh, seen as better entertainment. ABC's bells and whistles captured the spectacle of the AFL. The network was the perfect partner for the innovative league which brought the two-point conversion to pro football, along with names on the backs of jerseys. I had a couple of guys reference to me that, you know, Marty, you're really a big name in pro football. You know that, don't you? And I said, well, what do you mean? Well, look at your name. It's 14 letters. That's a big name in pro football. It did pose some issues for our, our equipment staff. So the AFL allowed these kinds of things, clearly aware that they were trying to juice up the presentation. There was definitely a kind of a ragtag, Mickey Rooney, let's put on a show in the backyard kind of quality to it. Halftime at Patriots Games is a showcase for talent in the greater Boston area. This is the famous Boston Latin School Band. These young ladies are from Roslindale High. It's a little cool out there, even for synthetic grass skirts, but the fans love it. We had to make it fun. We had to make the experience good. I mean, we're, we're in Oakland fighting for our lives against the 49ers, you know, and we have to, you know, it has to be more fun to go to a Raider game. Denver was home to unintentional comedy. The Broncos' hosiery was the cruelest joke of all. If they were ever going to have the last laugh, the Broncos would need to hold a roast for their funny socks. They decided to have a big night. They took and they piled up all the old uniforms, including the socks. These two guys came out onto the field with torches 
and they circled the field in front of the fans and dropped the torches into the pile of the old uniforms, and uh, that was the end of them. Denver fans were overjoyed to see their Broncos in new uniforms. Go, 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 happy from your head right down to your feet. Costume changes were common in this backyard show of a football league. Before they were the silver and black, the Raiders spent three seasons as the black and gold. Life can be a beautiful thing. Bills founder Ralph Wilson once owned part of the NFL's Lions. When he came to Buffalo, so did Detroit's silver and blue. Two years later, the Bills donned red, white, and blue. And every Sunday, their fans partied like it was the 4th of July. At War Memorial Stadium, there were no rules. There were no regulations. People would bring grills in the aisles. And just pass kegs of beer, tapping it. It was a party. It was a festival. You don't need to run. AFL might as well have stood for Always Fun League. You don't need to run. No one knew what they might see next. We're playing the Boston Patriots in Boston at Boston Field. All the fans, they thought the game was over. So they all came down on the field in that corner of the end zone, and we got time left for one play. We call a slant pass to Chris Burford. Burford is wide open, but suddenly something hits the ball, and it flies out of the end zone, game complete, we lose the ball game. Cotton Davidson, after the game, he comes over to me, very dejected, he said, Coach, a guy in a khaki jacket knocked that ball down. We get the films the next day, and sure enough, when the ball was snapped, a guy bounced across like a ballet dancer, reached up, took the ball, and that was it. I said, Jesus, I wish we could have found out who that was. That was the best defensive play we saw all year long in the American Football League. Hank Stram got his first head coaching opportunity in the AFL with the Dallas Texans in 1960. Before that, Stram had been an assistant coach in college football, where he'd learned from the legends. Spring practice for the Crimson Tide of Alabama, and everything... Bear Bryant coached in the tower, and a lot of coaches in that era said, well, I'm going to get on a tower because Bear does it. So Hank Stram coached from a tower in practices, Texan practices. Well, he liked it so much. The second year, 1961, he said, let's take that tower down to the Cotton Bowl and I'm going to coach there this weekend. So the people who bought the good seats can't see the game. They're yelling at him and throwing stuff. He coached the game from the tower and after one game, I think Lamar and some of the people told him, you just can't do that. Hank got things in his head and he was determined to see them through. Hank Stram was the best quarterback coach that I ever had. He was my coach at Purdue for a couple of years, and he had helped develop my skills. Getting ready for the 62 season, Lenny had been in the National Football League for five years and threw like 24 passes. And he was very disappointed and very disgruntled about the fact that he wasn't playing. So I told him at that time, I said, Lenny, if I give anything, if I could get you, so if you have a chance, if any way you can get away from where you are, let me know and we'll bring you to Dallas. I say, well, sure enough, in the spring of the year, he calls me and he said, Coach Brown said that he would put me on waivers and that I would be available for you. And i never forget that I talked to Paul Brown and Coach Brown said, now, Hank, he said, I want to tell you something. I know you're very loyal and I know you have a strong feeling for Leonard Dawson, but that kid has lost it. And he said, if you insist on keeping him, you're going to lose your job. Reunited with his college mentor, Len Dawson, spent 1962 matriculating towards stardom. Each of the winners will receive an S-55 Mercury convertible presented by Lincoln Mercury. The first presentation will be to Lenny Dawson, Player of the Year. As the season went on, we start dominating people. We had Abner Haynes in the backfield who was having a phenomenal year. And all of a sudden we're thinking, hey, we could be the team to win it all this year. On the field, Lamar Hunt's team was winning. Off of it, 
his league was still struggling to compete with the NFL, especially in two team towns like Dallas and New York. Chargers owner Baron Hilton conceded Los Angeles to the NFL's Rams, moving south to San Diego in 1961. That same year, the Oakland Raiders were close to abandoning the Bay Area. They were thinking of either sending us to Seattle or New Orleans, and our owners were going to back out because they needed money. And Wayne Valley had told Ralph Wilson, I think we're going to have to shut it down. And Ralph, to his credit, realized we can't go on with seven teams. You can't have a pro football league with seven teams. Wilson kept the Raiders alive by loaning them $400,000. Oakland general partner Wayne Valley joked that the AFL owners had become a foolish club. Everyone was losing money, some more visibly than others. H.L. Hunt, Lamar Hunt's father, was asked... We understand your son's uh, football franchise lost a million dollars this year. And H.L. Hunt said, well, at, at that rate, he can only go another 100 years. He can last 100 years. I guess he's only got 123 years left. I've heard many different numbers, and all of them are overly flattering numbers, by the way. <laughs> Not every owner was able to hold out for a hundred years. By 1962, New York's polo grounds had become a graveyard, where Titans owner Harry Wismer was buried in debt. I remember it was a November day, very sunny at the polo grounds. We were practicing, and suddenly there was a, a kind of an emptiness, a hollowness. And the coaches had surreptitiously slithered off the field. And somebody said, paychecks. I'll bet their paychecks up in the locker room. We realized that the coaches had gotten theirs and they had a two or three subway stop head start on us, headed to the one bank, Irving Trust, and the one branch, 39th Street, <laughs> and the one teller who was authorized to cash a Titan paycheck. He had a window and he had the total in front of him, and every time somebody cashed a check and he gave him money, he subtracted that, and when he got to zero, he closed the window. You know, we couldn't cash a check or run a bill at Mr. Leterio's grocery store across from the apartment. I mean, Mr. Leterio is a fine Italian gentleman. At one time or another, he'd probably taken care of everybody in the neighborhood, but he just apologized. He said, I, I read about your husband's football team and I can't let you have this sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Three years earlier, Harry Wismer had been a founding member of the Foolish Club, sharing a common dream with Bud Adams and Lamar Hunt. By the end of the 62 season, his Titans were bankrupt. The league needed a success story in New York. So Wismer's former partners put his franchise up for sale. Whoever owned it next would have to put on a better show than Wismer ever did. Even though teams were losing a million dollars or more a year, and the people who were most closely involved were frequently discouraged, they understood that they really had something here. The league was within the reach of finally being successful. The first debate, I was driving from Orlando down to Miami. And so I heard it on radio, and I got to my radio station, and I said, boy, that was really close. And Nixon was bright, Kennedy was bright, they agreed on a lot of things. They ain't going to change the numbers at all. And they were, everyone there was saying, you didn't see it? I said, no. Kennedy killed him. If you had sat with a transcript of that debate, Nixon won. But Kennedy looked young and vigorous, and Nixon looked old and tired. It was another part of American life that was transformed by television. Television could turn perception into reality and back again. Unitas gives to Amici. The Clemson champion, Amici scores! In 1958, it transformed the NFL into a rising power among American sports. Four years later, on December 23, 1962, the Houston Oilers and Dallas Texans would play in the AFL's third title game, live on ABC. This was the day the new league would take its first step into the American spotlight. We threw two or three interceptions in the first half, and we got down 17 to nothing very, very quickly. 
It's a fake to McClinton. Dawson throwing to Hayes. He's got it to 20. He's under the five, and he's able to Hayes. The Texans looked like they would cruise to their first championship. But in blew that famous Houston weather, and with it, the winds of change. Who can hurt you from any place on the field in many ways if you saw him stay in bounds and In the second half, the Oilers roared back to tie the game at 17. Like the NFL four years earlier, the AFL was producing a sudden death drama on live television. This was theater. And thanks to ABC's emphasis on sound, the lead roles would have speaking parts. Playoff period. Let's go down to Jack at the 50-yard line. Right here in the playing field, and very shortly we're going to have the toss of the coin as the overtime period will come about. Stram decided having 40-mile-an-hour winds at Dallas's back was more important than getting the ball first. So he told Abner Haynes to choose the wind if Dallas won the toss. While the coin's in there, and call it loudly now. Yeah. Call it. Heads. Heads. Now Dallas won. You have your choice, of course, receiving or kicking. We will kick to the clock. You're going to kick? Yeah. To the clock. Right. Now Dallas won. Haynes misspoke. He thought he was taking the wind, but the words, we'll kick, meant Dallas had made its choice and would kick off. Houston then chose which end zone to defend. The Oilers would begin overtime with the wind and the ball. It was a dramatic twist a nation of viewers got to see and hear. Well, Kurt, I asked one of the Dallas players what it was all about, and he simply said Abner Haynes had made a mistake. Stram was, you know, on the sideline talking to, to Haynes in a very um, consoling way. Obviously, he knew he'd made a huge mistake. It was a great insight into a player-coach relationship in, in such a critical game, in such a critical situation. Neither team scored in the first overtime. In the second, the team switched sides and Dallas finally had the wind at its back. Dallas now in real scoring position. Dawson would hold for rookie Tommy Brooker, who had a chance to kick Dallas to a championship. I said, Tommy, just keep your head down, keep it still, and pump it through there, baby. He said, don't worry about it, coach. I'll kick that sucker right through there like it had eyes. You can win the game with this field. The game is tied 17-17. Dawson will hold to the 24. And watch it. The big rush is on. The kick is up. The kick is good. Dallas is the champion. Dallas wins it on a 24-yard field goal by Tommy Brooker. The coach Hank Stram carried on the field. There's no way that you can come away from it and not say, this was one of the greatest football games ever played. All of that, the magic carpet of television brought right into your living room. One of the greatest football games I've ever seen. Dallas's victory ended Houston's two-year run as champions. But it also came on a day in which weather was particularly bad up in the Northeast. There were a lot of people watching the game on TV. And congratulations. Thank you very much, Jack. And it was an excellently played game. It was a dramatic game. It was the AFL's real coming-of-age party. And uh, we're just as can we, that we can win the championship and bring it back to Dallas, Texas. I thought, geez, this is it. The Cowboys are going to be leaving. Uh, they'll have to leave Dallas now because we are the champions. But that was the case. The case was that Lamar Hunt wanted the league to succeed. Lamar Hunt realized, even though he wanted to stay in Dallas, he could not be truly successful in a town that was divided. The Cowboys could wait it out longer because the NFL was going to be around. The NFL was clearly there to stay. The AFL was much more of a touch and go proposition. What he needed to do was create the perception and also the reality that the league was becoming more successful. And the only way to do that was to move his franchise. For Hank Stram to win the championship in 1962 and then move, he said he just, he just cried his eyes out. Lamar sat him down and said, look, we are not going to make it this way. Broke his heart too. In the years to come, the AFL would need more than a few successful teams. It would need a league of strong franchises. It would need palatial new homes and compelling new faces. 
But before any of that could happen, Lamar Hunt would have to put the league before his team. For Hunt, for his Kansas City Chiefs, for the AFL, for everyone. History was about to crack wide open. I certainly felt at the time, frankly, I didn't know anybody who didn't feel it at the time, that, um, well, in the words of the songs, that, that the times were changing. In 1963, change came hard, and it came fast. The Beatles' first album. The March on Washington. Desegregation. And an assassination. At first glance, sport seemed the same as it ever was. But the order was rapidly fading. America's favorite sport was changing. Folks found out there was another league worth rooting for. When I came to Miami to break in, I got off the train, and there were two water fountains. And one said colored and one said white, and I came from New York. I never heard of this. So I drank out of the colored fountain. The water was nice, good and cold. And then I got on a bus to go to my uncle's house where I was going to stay to try to break into radio. And I uh, sat in the back of the bus, and a bus driver stops the bus and says, move to the front. I said, why? Well, I like the back. He said, no, the back is for the coloreds. But the 60s is when it changed. In 1963, the civil rights movement was gathering momentum. But for African Americans in all professions, including the National Football League, true equality was an elusive goal. If you go back and look at the rosters of the NFL, there was a virtual quota, unspoken, unofficial, in terms of the numbers of blacks that would be allowed on a team. You might have two African-American players on a team or four, but you would never have three or five because you wanted those players to room together on the road. For you to room with a Caucasian player was just unthinkable at that time. They weren't going to do that. We were dealing with race every day because on every level we were fighting to have an equal playing field. Even after blacks were brought in, they were consigned to particular positions. You know, it was unheard of for, for black to be a, a, a weak safety or a middle linebacker or a quarterback. Hey, you got to think if you're a quarterback or a middle linebacker, the niggers can't think. What are you talking about? And this was like standard kind of talk. I mean, people believed this shit about whites and blacks. Now in its fourth year of existence, the American Football League had a higher percentage of black players on their rosters than the NFL. But their open door policy was not out of generosity. It was a necessity. There were very few people in the American Football League who were also members of the NAACP. If you're starting a new football league, the coin of the realm is good football players. It wasn't an overwhelming sense of justice. It was business. The league couldn't afford to have a racist bone in its body. The AFL was colorblind. Yet much of America remained a segregated society. The notion that blacks and whites could be equal uh, was hard won for a lot of people in the country to accept. Every black athlete that I ever played with or against faced discrimination. When I was uh, captain of the Chargers and Charlie McNeil, an African-American defensive back, our parents go to the game. My parents sat on the 40 or 50 yard line and Charlie McNeil's parents sat in the end zone, roped off section of the end zone. We went to a movie. The management said, well, the, your black people will have to go upstairs and sit in the balcony. That's the law. So we all went up in the balcony. The whole team sat in the balcony and 10 or 15 minutes later, the lights came on and the state police came in and discussed and we all left the theater together. Kansas City, you had hell finding a house. You had to stay in the black neighborhood. We didn't have the same freedoms 
that the white players had. Finding a house may have been difficult, but by the mid-60s, African-American players had found a home in the AFL. One of the things that you notice in watching the AFL games were the number of players from small colleges and from a lot of small black colleges, Texas Southern and Grambling and uh, Prairie View and North Carolina A&T. The AFL was able to find those players more so than uh, it seemed like the NFL. Does he run at 9-4, is that right? 9 yeah. He runs at 9 four. And that's what the AFL did. I mean, the AFL gave opportunities. It was just a new day for the football players in the black colleges. The players, they had a feeling of being wanted and a feeling of belonging to the American Football League. They recruited those players aggressively. Lloyd Wells, the first full-time African-American scout in pro football. Lloyd Wells was responsible for the signing of numerous uh, players from historically black colleges. Emma Thomas, Willie Lanier, and Buck Buchanan from Grambling. Buck Buchanan broke the glass ceiling. He was the first African-American player drafted number one overall by either league. Came up big for everybody that ever played at a small African-American college. The San Diego Chargers also had a pipeline to historically black colleges. Their top scout was a young assistant coach who would later make his name with the Raiders. We wanted to win. We wanted the best players. We weren't interested in who they were or exactly where they came from. The Chargers' progressive attitude toward scouting was no surprise. Their head coach had fought discrimination his whole life. Sid Gilman was Jewish, and he'd been turned down at, by several Big Ten colleges because the alumni said, you can't have a, a, a Jewish person as a coach of our a Big Ten team. Think about this. Think about this. Think about what would have happened if Sid Gilman had been named the head coach at Ohio State when Woody Hayes got that job. Instead of being three yards in a cloud of dust, it could have been the you know, Ohio State Express. Most NFL teams maybe had three to five black players. The Chargers had 10 to 15. In training camp, he assigned rooms by position, so there'd be a natural integration of the players. Sid was way, way ahead of his time. The coach was ahead of his time, but the team had taken a step backwards in 1962, finishing with a 4-10 and 10 record. So Gilman took an old-school approach to the 1963 season. Sid Gilman got an idea that I know he's, to this day, he still considers brilliant. He decided he was going to isolate this squad during training, away from everything that could divert their attention from football. He took us uh, due east of San Diego out in the desert, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 miles. There were no neon lights or any distractions. There was a, an attempt to build a resort, a dude ranch up there, and it failed. The actual name of it, it was called Rough Acres. Can you imagine a town called Rough Acres? I mean, when you talk about Rough Acres Reds, the next property was Poverty Flats. So, you know, this was not the high red district. I go into my cabin. Toilets don't work. No showers. And in the bungalows, there was some rats. Some of the room, there was some bats hanging upside down in the guy's room. And I was using a donkey running around there, you know, really messing up the place. Once we were in a meeting and we saw this gigantic furry thing coming across the room, and it was a tarantula bigger than Ernie Ladd's hand with hair on it. I get out to the field, and I say field, but uh, using that term rather loosely because all it was was sawdust and dirt. But I bend down to pick up what I think is an arts and craft bracelet. The bracelet straightens out. It's a baby rattler. One thing that a professional team needs in training camp is the concentration. 
at Rough Acres, we had nothing to, to bother us. The pro football and a dude ranch are a strange mix. Then again, so were the 1963 Chargers. Sid Gilman was an eccentric genius. Defensive lineman Ernie Ladd was an off-season wrestler. And Ron Mix, their future Hall of Fame lineman, was nicknamed the Intellectual Assassin. It takes a, an unusual person to be a football player. I don't have unabashed love for football. Many people find that obscene. The majority of professional athletes do not love their sport. Frankly, my thoughts on the matter are rather confused. There was no confusion when determining the Chargers' best player. Wide receiver Lance Allworth's galloping gait and mild manner earned him the nickname Bambi. One of the most apt nicknames I've ever heard. Because Lance was, uh, you know, he was the gentlest creature in the forest. 10, 18, hot, hot, hot. He had a sense of delicacy about him. The game, as he played it, didn't have to be brutish. Let's take a close look at this catch by the fantastic Lance Dolworth. Lance Allworth was the best wide receiver of the 60s, and he played in the AFL. Allworth would become the first AFL player inducted into the Hall of Fame. But even in 1963, teammates thought he was blessed with higher powers. I remember once we were flying home from New York and we'd go through this big thunderstorm. Things were just like shaking all over. And I was really frightened. Then I thought, wait a minute, Lance is on this plane. God wouldn't kill Lance. Suddenly I was very calm. Sid Gilman was occasionally calm. He was also occasionally caustic. You don't have to go tight on it, except if you want to hold that weak safety man right. in there, see? So you go Y post, U corner. Okay. And don't fuck it up again. San Diego's style was easy to identify. A ball in the air and a bow tie on the sidelines. You know, Sid Gilman was George Hamilton. He was always suntanned. He just had an aura about him that he was in control and his team was the best. The Chargers were the dominant franchise of the early AFL, appearing in five of the first six championship games. The AFL was known as a freewheeling bombs away league, and that reputation was largely the result of San Diego and its virtuoso coach. You gonna get into Gilman too? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you're gonna, you know, talk about coaches, he's just a football coach. The Einstein, the master of offensive passing game in the National and the American Football League. Let me show you how to run a hook pass. The field is 100 yards long, and it's 53 and two-thirds yards wide. And we decided we're going to use every inch of it. We get a guy in every one of these areas, there's nobody can cover us. First time he was 50, went cover seven. Second time he was 40, still went cover seven. I haven't seen any strong coverage yet. The passing game, getting the ball vertically down the field, the one back, offense and again Lance you run that hook and and get that leveling off period and sit down he was doing things then in the early 60s that, that, that some teams are just getting to now the tobacco was sometimes harsh <coughs> but the offense was always smooth Ten games into the 1963 season, the Chargers were eight and two, and racing past the competition in the Western Division. Once Mr. Lowe gets a yard, there's no catching him. Oh, that must be hurt. 
state-of-the-art football team in 1963. We'd go into games where we knew we were going to win just because uh, we felt like we were better coached. The passing game got the attention, but San Diego also ranked first in defense and rushing yards. It looked like nothing could stop the Chargers' title run. But on November 22nd, 1963, the season and the nation suddenly stood still. A dark page in the annals of America has been written to the crack of an assassin's bullet. A nation mourns, the world grieves. This was a tremendous hammer to the heart uh, for the whole country. He was assassinated on a Friday. A decision had to be made probably in less than 24 hours as to whether to cancel the weekend games. Back in those days, you always played the game. If your wife had a baby, um, if a parent passed away or a family passed away, you always played the game. I wanted to play the games. I said, uh, you won't get me to play the games. Our team won't play. And I didn't know, I, was, I, I, I didn't even ask my owner, but I said, I won't play the games. The AFL postponed its games. Before making his decision, NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle consulted Kennedy's press secretary, Pierre Salinger. 48 hours after the assassination, the NFL played. Saying that we did it, because they would have wanted, Kennedy would have wanted it that way, was crap. Playing that game was insane. I certainly think in the immediate aftermath, the AFL looked better in the public eye. People were glued to the television around all of that, and I think the NFL's kidding itself if it thought that it was making a big difference in how people responded. And was still focused on Dallas. On Sunday, at 1221 Eastern Time, viewers saw Jack Ruby kill Lee Harvey Oswald. He's been shot. Decades later, the NFL's decision to play that weekend is still controversial and misunderstood. Well, Pete Rozelle, I think, later admitted his absolute biggest mistake was playing that game. And Rozelle has said himself later on that he regretted the decision to go ahead and play the games. And I think Rozelle was quoted as saying that uh, if he had it to do over again, he wouldn't have played. There's no question. Now, when Roselle retired in 1989, reporters asked him, Pete, what are the achievements you're proudest of? And he'd go ABC, the merger, uh, Super Bowl, and so on. And then, almost without asking the question, almost telling Pete, they'd say, I guess your biggest mistake was playing those games on Kennedy Sunday. And Pete would say, yeah, it was a tough period. It was a tough time. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. But off camera, Pete really didn't feel that that was a big mistake. I think too much is made of that historically. A lot of criticism is leveled at Pete Rozelle. But a month later, only a month later, Sports Illustrated names him their Sportsman of the Year. So it wasn't as though the NFL was drowning in shame. That was funny because the official couldn't get the hanky out of his pocket, so he threw his hat. Gino Capaletti has been part of Patriots football for nearly half a century and has seen firsthand how drastically the football landscape in New England has changed from the start. In 1960, the Boston Patriots were a team of no names and long shots trying to find a new life in the AFL. Many of the Patriot players have taken up permanent residence in Greater Boston. The historic town of Concord is home to Captain Tony Sardisco. Tony follows the financial news with close interest. He and his family have been living in Concord since he was signed by the Patriots last year. 
Despite appearances, the early patriots never had time to get comfortable in their surroundings. We were a team that could not enjoy a home field advantage because we played at so many different locations. We played uh, at Boston University Field, uh, Fenway Park, Boston College, Harvard, before we got a permanent home. But I think that you know, kind of tested our mettle, and I think it was good for us. Game time on Friday night, and the crowds gather at the ticket windows at Boston University Field. Pass through the gates and enter into the excitement of professional football. Tonight, We're the only team that played in Friday nights. The, now, the reason uh, Patriots played at Friday nights at home is because in those days, the New York Giants were the biggest team in New England. They were on television Sunday afternoon, and Patriots didn't want to compete with them. I thought it was smart marketing to do it on Fridays. The Giants were very well loved, and if you probably took a poll of who the fans were watching, probably a majority of them were watching Giants games, much more so than uh, our games. And in fact, uh, that was part of the adversity of the old Boston Patriots is trying to win those fans over to our side. Like so many of his teammates, Capaletti started his Patriots career as an anonymous player trying to find a home in pro football. In 1959, I was a quarterback for a championship football team. It was a touch football team. And the team was called Mac and Caps. And this is a team that was sponsored by a, a bar that I was working at. Capaletti was actually bartending at the time the AFL had started. And at that point, if you were a mailman, if you were a chef, if you were a school teacher, if you knew how to play football and you wanted to try out, most teams were giving you a tryout back in 1960. Uh, Capaletti got one. Lou Saban called and he says, Capaletti? And I says, yeah. And he says, listen, I'm sending you a minimum contract to 7,500. He says, and you got as good a chance as anyone to make this team. I said, wow, I went flying off the uh, couch. And when I came to the Patriots, I told them I was a defensive back and a place kicker. They were trying out various kickers, and it came down to Gino and another guy. Well, Babe Perilli was the holder, and uh, Babe and Gino were very, very close. So when they were trying the other guy, Perilli would take the snap from the center, put the ball down, and press down on the point of that ball. He kind of put a little pressure on when it was the other guy's turn. And when Gino's turn came, take the snap, put it down perfect. And Gino's drilling the field goals, the other guys all over the place. And that took care of him. Over the next decade, Capaletti became one of the great clutch kickers in AFL history. Only one second remains to be played. Gino boots it. A tremendous come from behind win by the Patriots. But Capaletti was more than just a kicking threat. After spending his rookie season as a defensive back, he switched to receiver and became one of the league's top pass catchers. He led the AFL in scoring five times. He was the first Patriots true star. He was the first one that people began to recognize in New England and say, you know, this guy plays for the Patriots. This guy's pretty good. And Gino's star quality with the Patriots translated into star quality for the league. Capaletti, I believe, is a good enough player to be in the Hall of Fame. He's the all-time leading scorer in the American Football League. I think that in itself uh, qualifies him for that. For his accomplishments, for the points he scored, for the touchdowns he scored, the field goals, everything else, I think he absolutely positively belongs in the Hall of Fame. And Gino helped establish the Patriots, therefore helped establish the American Football League. By 1962, the Patriots were finally making some noise in Boston. And they were doing so under one of the league's quietest coaches. Lou Saban had been replaced by Mike Holovac. You know, in the early stages of the American Football League, Weeb, Sid Gilman, Hank Stram, <laughs> guys at that time understood that we don't know if this league's going to survive. So they had to give it like a little bit of the Vince McMahon stuff or the wrestling stuff. No good! They were very flamboyant. They talked a lot. Oh, no! It was out of bounds! Mike could never force himself to be a personality under any circumstances. He was the most laid-back, soft-spoken, 
understated guy you could ever meet. Yeah. They were in an over, so I went to back to the Forty fourth pick in an over, huh? No kidding. First time. Okay, that's all right. Mike was only one of these golly fish hooks kind of guys. You know, he's always been a very uh, religious guy. Ah, oh, darn it. Now, he could get mad, but, you know, he wouldn't be outrageous. Will anything ever happen right for us? Gee. I never heard him swear, uh, but it was uh, golly gee, fellas, you know. Gee whiz. Holovac had a unique strategy on how to best use his star kicker slash receiver. Oh, I used to be in the huddle and I'd be looking at the sideline and I said, oh, don't tell me he's taking me out on third down. You know, that's the, the key down in football. I would take him out on third down and he wondered why. I said, Gino, I said, I want you rested because you're going to kick a field goal next play. Hey, Gino. Gino, go, go at Z when I send you in from now on. Let Artie stay, all right? Yeah, he says, but I want to be in there. Maybe we won't have to kick a field goal if I'm in it. Guarantee it. There were times he would send in a running play on third down, like saying, well, we'll take the three points here. And I'm saying, he's, he thinks we're going to just get three points every time we kick the ball. I said, uh, you know, what great confidence he has in me. But I started to feel that confidence uh, through some of his actions. Gino, take your jacket off. I had the greatest of admiration for him for the way he handled people. But I think the whole team kind of settled in with Mike's calmness. And... Um, we became better players. Red, white, and blue, the 1963 Eastern Division champions of the American Football League, the star-studded Boston Patriots, continue to hold the admiration and loyalty of the football fans of New England. Under the energetic leadership of the popular Mike Holovac, head coach and general manager, Boston's Gridiron Minutemen have become one of the most crowd-pleasing sports organizations in America. <laughs> In 1963, the team that was once unknown in Boston now boasted 11 AFL All-Stars, including number 72 defensive end Larry Eisenhower and number 85 future Hall of Fame middle linebacker Nick Bonaconti. Bonaconti and the defense helped lead the Patriots to the 1963 Eastern Division title. Their toughest test lay ahead in the AFL championship game when they traveled to San Diego to face Sid Gilman's potent Chargers. In my humble estimation, uh, I believe that uh, their defensive unit is one of the best in all of football. People can talk about the, uh, the Bears and they can talk about the Packers' defensive unit. I think that uh, the defensive unit of the uh, Boston Patriots is uh, one of the best and is equal to any in football. If the Patriots' defense was equal to any in football, then San Diego's offense would have to be considered one of the best of all time. It was an absolute perfect game, and it was just as if some type of magical essence had enveloped that entire squad. They just did it all that day. Every button they pushed worked, and uh, as good as they were, we were horrible. Patriots as a whole were a, a blitzing team. Sid Gilman devised a plan to run some decoy moves, some motion sets so that it would neutralize the blitzing defense and that was their downfall in the 63 championship. You live by the blitz, you die by the blitz sometimes. Keith Lincoln compiled 329 rushing and receiving yards and San Diego's 51 to 10 victory left no doubt they were the AFL's best team. But with the first Super Bowl still three years away, one question remains unanswered. Could they have beaten the NFL champs? The best team I played on was a 63 Charger team. And I would really have liked to have played the uh, NFL champion that year, the Bears. I would have given anything to play them that year. The Bears were sort of a three yards in a cloud of dust outfit. Old time NFL team, the Chargers against the Bears in 63 really would have been a study in contrast. Most people you talk to, including the great Otto Graham, would tell you that the 63 Chargers probably would have been the winners of the first Super Bowl if it was back in 63. If you look at their ring from 1963, the ring says world champions. 
and they challenged the Bears to uh, a championship game. The Bears declined. And as we told people, if they want to argue, we'll let them pick the, the field, the time, and we'll even use air footballs. This is only the beginning. You have one of the youngest teams in the league, don't you? Yes, and if we can just keep them uh, mentally and physically sound, why we should look forward to some fine football in the future. The Chargers had won the 1963 championship with 35-year-old quarterback Tobin Rote. Six years earlier, Rote led the Detroit Lions to the 1957 NFL championship, and he's the only quarterback to win titles in both leagues. But after 1959, Rote was no longer wanted by the Lions, and he eventually found a new home in the AFL. A 13-year veteran from Rice, Rote was the top passer in the Canadian Football League. He'll be a welcome addition indeed. Other AFL passers who were thought of as NFL outcasts included George Blanda, Tom Flores, Babe Perilli, and Jack Kemp. I've been in the NFL for three years, hanging on by the, you know, by my fingernails and wanting to play pro football. There were only 12 teams in the 50s. Kemp was somebody who'd had a couple tryouts with NFL teams. He played for Buddy Parker in Pittsburgh, and they had an exhibition game in Los Angeles. And Jack Kemp was also a punter, and Parker told him to just punt it out of bounds. But Kemp just kicked this booming punt, went all the way almost down to the end zone, and then was brought back and returned for a touchdown and Kemp sort of sheepishly went to the sidelines and Buddy Parker was waiting for him and he said, Kemp, you're gonna be a good punter in this league someday, but not for me, you're cut. He cut him right on the sidelines during the preseason game. So that's another indication of what the mindset was in the NFL at that time. Spent a short time in Canada, came back and was out of uh, work and, and was looking around to maybe end my career, go to graduate school and study political science and uh, uh, economics and so forth, not knowing what I was going to do. And right about that time, the American League was starting to get off the ground. Kemp became a starter for the AFL's Chargers and led the team to back-to-back -back championship games in 1960 and 61. After injuring his hand during the 1962 season, Kemp was waived by San Diego and found a permanent home in Buffalo. For other quarterbacks, like the Chiefs' Len Dawson, the AFL provided new opportunities not only on the field, but off it. There were only three television stations here in Kansas City, and one of them was looking for a sportscaster, and the Chiefs recommended me. The Chiefs wanted one of their guys on that one of those stations so that they weren't getting bad mouth and hopefully to sell some tickets. And I was anchoring sports here in Kansas City on the 6 o'clock and the 10 o'clock news. Frank, you had a great year last year. What are your goals for this year? We get through practices at 5.30. I'd rush through the shower and get downtown, and I was on the 6 o'clock news. And uh, defensively, as far as the Chiefs are concerned, we have some new faces out there that we have to take a look at. His appearances on the local news led to a long career in TV and radio. And they should be thinking about it is, on first out, a play-action pass against... Dawson the... was the AFL's all-time leading passer. Yet the media of the 60s wasn't kind to the future Hall of Famer and other so-called retread quarterbacks. Len Dawson had to deal with the perception that he was somebody who was a bench warmer in the National Football League who succeeded in the AFL just because it was a lesser league. You know, the NFL was the only ones calling them retreads, but back then it was the animosity. It was anything we can do to discredit the players, the teams, the league. That's what we're going to write about, and that's what we're going to call them. And uh, people like myself weren't buying it. You know, we knew how good they were. They all felt like second-class citizens. They all felt like they had something to prove. And I think that was a common bond with all of them. You know, the quarterbacks of the AFL, my guess is they are as good as most NFL quarterbacks of the decade. But the quarterbacks that you remember, John Unitas, you know, Y.E. Tittle, you know, I think these guys are less remembered simply because they were in the AFL rather than the NFL. 
In its first few seasons, the AFL had gained a reputation as a league that depended on gadgets, gimmicks, and wide open offense. But from the start of their existence, the Buffalo Bills didn't fit the mold of a typical AFL team. The Bills' first head coach was Buster Ramsey, who came over from the Detroit Lions, where he had been the defensive coordinator. And, uh, you know, his defensive teams at Detroit got into the NFL championship game several times in the 50s. The team had many weaknesses we couldn't strengthen. However, Buster Ramsey didn't make an easy transition to the AFL. We lost four of our five preseason games, then four of our first five regular season contests. I've got some game action sequences over here that will show you better than I can explain what happened. I think you'll understand why I wasn't happy. Kill the lights, Breezy. The lights went out on Ramsey after two straight losing seasons. He was replaced by former Patriots head coach Lou Saban, who instilled his own defensive philosophy in Buffalo. So we'll go to work and see if we can't uh, set up two types of defense, at least two different ideas of thinking against Lee and one against Blanda. Lou was a kind of a down-in-the-dirt uh, fundamental coach. It was the kind of team that really was, would sell well in Buffalo because they were a blue-collar town, so it was a good match in Buffalo and uh, with Lou. Buffalo Stadium was known as the Rock Pile, and its fans were hardcore. It's the only place I've ever been to when you walk off after a game, we put our helmets on because you get hit with full beer cans. And I can understand if someone's going to throw an empty bottle or something at you. But this is the only place that they actually threw full beer at you, which is kind of crazy. It was nice, though, because you could, you know, you catch one and have one on the way to the locker room, if you, you know, if you're, you're lucky enough to grab one. Under Saban, the Bills became as tough as their fans. They were probably the first team that kind of looked like an NFL team. They were, they were running more than they were passing. Their defense just was overpowering. The defense included an unknown named Marty Schottenheimer, who was simply grateful for a job in Buffalo. Just a young guy, happy to be playing professional football, and I got a two-year no-cut contract. I think it was $24,000 for each of those years. Uh, I got a nice signing bonus, uh, 10000 or something like that, and a new Buick Riviera. <laughs> right now, it's time to take a step forward. Schottenheimer would enjoy a nearly 40-year ride in pro football, including more than 20 as a head coach. Everything is possible. Together. Hey, let's go. This is football, man. This is why we're out here. In his playing days, however, life wasn't so easy on the sidelines. Schottenheimer was mainly a special teamer who found it impossible to crack the starting lineup of Buffalo's talented defense. John Tracy, Mike Stratton, and Harry Jacobs, as a linebacking corps, played together for 67 straight games. That's four or five seasons. Harry Jacobs was called the baby-faced assassin. <laughs> I guess for the obvious reasons, he, was, he had a pudgy little face, and he was a hard hitter. He was not particularly great athlete, but Harry found ways to get things done, and uh, he just ran the whole thing, making all the calls. Let's go. We got to stop him right here. Nothing. Red, red, right, double wing, red. Outside, outside. Move head up, sis. Outside. He was really the captain of the ship when it came to, to the defense in terms of running the show. Okay, nothing. It's going to work. We can't have nothing. Let's get those hands up here, baby. It's going to work. This is going to make first tackle, huh? Let's go, baby. Let's make the first one again, baby. He and I were in very tough competition because I couldn't crack the lineup. Harry understood the game. I went to him because I'm trying to pick his brain. What did you do against the first wing? 
Grand Thunder on. Though Schottenheimer's number had changed from 56 to 57, his eagerness to learn from Jacobs remained constant. Yellow dog four? No, that was uh, six one. Oh, 61. Three, 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 yeah. I want to get some of this information that he's got because clearly the reason he was in their plan was because of his command of the game and his understanding of how, how things were to be done. Nobody scores. Let's go uh, 44 short. Against Jacobs and the Bills, the AFL's most wide-open offenses were slammed shut. In 1964 and 65, Buffalo gave up the fewest points in the league. During that two-year span, the Bills went 17 straight games without allowing a rushing touchdown, a pro football record that still stands. I think it lent itself to the way that Lou Saban wanted to play football. He's going to play defense, and uh, he was going to smack you in the mouth on offense. He was going to run over you. The runaway vehicle in Saban's offense was number 34, Cookie Gilchrist. And while his runs usually resulted in a crash, he always arrived in style. He had a huge pink Cadillac, and painted on the front grill backwards was looky, looky, here comes Cookie. So in your rearview mirror, you had no doubt who it was. As if people in Buffalo didn't know a six foot five, 250 pound black guy with sunglasses driving a pink Cadillac was Cookie Gilchrist. In 1962, Gilchrist became the AFL's first thousand yard rusher. Cookie Gilchrist, pound for pound, inch for inch, the greatest all around football player that I ever played with or watched play. Cookie enjoyed running the ball straight ahead so that he could get to hit somebody. And it didn't matter if I was in his way or the guy I was supposed to block was in his way. You know, he was going to hit somebody. And uh, some of the hardest licks I've ever gotten were from the backslide with Cookie. I remember a game against the Patriots in which uh, Chuck Shana went to tackle him, and he ran right over Shana and knocked him out. Other defensive guys are kind of gathered around him when Cookie walks right into their huddle and says, which one of you motherfuckers is next? <laughs> to go with the AFL's most punishing runner, the Bills' offense also had one of the league's most rugged quarterbacks in Jack Kemp. He was very tough. He once broke his hand, and while the hand was healing, he had the doctor form it around a football so that when it healed, he would be, still be able to hold the ball and throw it. Jack had as strong an arm as I've ever seen. I mean, he used to go out there and stand on one 10 yard line and launch one of those things down there, and literally he could hit the goal line and he could throw the ball 90 yards in the air. I've never seen anything like it in my life, certainly before and, and not since. Kemp's greatest attribute, however, was a mind that went beyond football. We referenced to him as the senator, even at that time. He had a, a tremendous, tremendous interest in the political field, and most things intellectual. I mean, he, he was not your typical 1960s football player. To me, I've always felt that quarterbacking is about 90% mental. That is, there are many football players, many quarterbacks who can throw and carry out the mechanics of quarterbacking, but in the final analysis, the difference between the average uh, quarterbacks and the good ones are the ones that uh, who can handle the, the mental aspect, that is the audibleizing and, and the calling of plays. You know, we knew that Jack was going to be a politician when in the huddle he would call a in sweep and tell us not to take it too far to the left or too far to the right. So he was kind of down the middle. <laughs> you know, if guys were on a plane uh, playing cards or cutting up, listening to music, you know, Jack was reading some far out book. He used to come in the locker room with all these big books, you know, on the politics and uh, conservation. And I can remember Lou Saban, our coach, saying, Jack, 
Forget those books. Get your mind on football. Let's get with it. I know there's been a lot of teasing of me that I was more interested in politics or reading the Wall Street Journal than I was in the playbook. But uh, I knew football. I loved it. Maybe I didn't have the love of the X's and O's that some people have. There's a school of thought that if he had ate and slept and lived free the football, he might have been a better quarterback. But by the same token, he wouldn't have been as nearly an in as interesting a person. But the future congressman didn't always win the vote of the Buffalo fans, who showed strong support for number 12, backup Daryl LaMonica. West Side Buffalo was for LaMonica, and uh, other parts were for me. And it was, it was a two-quarterback town. And I'd get booed when I went in, and he'd get cheered when he was standing up on the sidelines. Kemp's first two seasons in Buffalo ended with the Bills falling short of the championship game. In 63, we lost to Boston. We got booed. I went up to Coach Saban, and I said, Coach, next year we're going to win. And you and I are going to come out in the middle of the uh, crowd, and we're going to look at all these people who are booing us today, and, uh, you know, uh, we're going to have our moment in the sun. And don't forget that. I told Coach Saban that. In 1964, Kemp led the Bills to a 9-0 start. But in week 10, he found himself in a political firestorm with Cookie Gilchrist. We were behind, and I was throwing, but he wanted to run. And, you know, we came to uh, loggerheads in the huddle, and uh, you can't have anybody talking in a huddle. So I told him to leave, and uh, he got mad at me and the coach and walked off, stormed off, sat down, wouldn't come back. Took himself off the game, sent his back up Willie Ross into the game. Uh, Lou Saban was livid and wanted to suspend him from the team. And it was through the ability of Jack Kemp to arbitrate between Gilchrist and the coach that he actually got back on the team. You could get exasperated with him, but uh, the team knew that we had to have him to go to the championship. Uh, a, B, everybody, everybody liked him. Gilchrist returned without missing a game and in 1964 earned his second AFL rushing title. The star runner helped guide the Bills to the AFL championship game against the Chargers and running back Keith Lincoln. A year earlier, Lincoln had rushed for more than 200 yards in the 1963 championship game. And now he helped the Chargers to an early 7-0 lead in Buffalo. But fittingly, the Bills' defense changed the course of the game. Sometimes a singular play like that defines a moment, defines a team, defines a season, and it did all that for Buffalo. And it grew to mythical proportions. The tackle heard round the world. Keith Lincoln is hit by Mike Stratton, and Lincoln is through for the day. When Keith went down, it was as though the lifeblood of the whole team had been sucked dry. And we all just started looking up and down at each other. And there was nothing more you could do. He was gone. With Lincoln out, the Bills overpowered the favored Chargers. The quarterback who had been cut from the NFL, let go by the Chargers, and booed a year earlier by his hometown fans, was now a champion. I went over to Saban and I said, hey, let's go out in the middle of the field and give everybody the victory salute. And uh, he laughed and all of a sudden I got picked up on people's shoulders. It was a powerful moment in our lives. But I think for me, what was the greatest thrill would be to go back in 65 and do it again in San Diego. In 1965, Jack Kemp was the AFL's most valuable player. But the Bills' strength was still their defense. And they again dominated Sid Gilman's Chargers in the title game. A league once dictated by high-scoring offense was now ruled by a new kind of champion. The Bills of the 1960s really elevated the AFL stature in the sense that they weren't just this crazy, pass-happy team. They were a very balanced, very disciplined team. So Buffalo had a very, very pivotal role, not only in the success of the AFL, but in the image of the AFL.
In July of 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed, outlawing discrimination in public places. We must not approach this law in a vengeful spirit. Its purpose is not to punish. Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions. Divisions which have lasted all too long. The letter of the law changed instantly, but the spirit of the country would take time. In the South and Southwest, desegregation was far from what the law uh, required it to be. Six months after the Civil Rights Act was signed, the AFL All-Star Game was scheduled for New Orleans, a city without a professional sports team. We were trying very hard to, to acquire uh, either an NFL or AFL expansion franchise for the city. That's why the game was put down there to see what type of drawing power um, the AFL would have with an All-Star Game. Black players soon discovered that New Orleans' red carpet was for whites only. In the restaurants, the patrons didn't want us to sit anywhere near them or the, the coats, we'd hang our coats on the wall and say, hey, don't put your coat next to mine. I checked in and I hear in the background somebody ask a question, well, was that Ernie Ladd? And another guy in the background says, uh, no, Ernie Ladd's a bigger nigger than that. That's, that lad is a big nigga. I get on the elevator to go to my room, and the elevator operator says, uh, you monkeys get in the back so everybody can get in. I said, you're an elevator operator, and I'm a monkey. We went out to get a taxi. Taxis were lining up out in front of the hotel. And Cookie Gilchrist, one of our players, says, hey, uh, we want a taxi. And the guy says, uh, we got to call y'all a colored cab. And Cook is said, hey, I don't care what color the cab is. I just want a taxi. Why can't we ride in one of these? So we decide we're going to visit the French quarters. The greeter standing there calling out to people, come in here, come in here. When we get close by, like a, like a mute. And we get to another door. We get ready to go in. This little guy standing there pulls out a gun. You are not coming in here. You niggas are not coming in here. As a black man, I cannot go through this indignity and play a game here. We were the last athletes, or the last guys you want to try to intimidate. We decided to have a meeting. We decided, you're not going to play. You always remember the funny things that happen in situations like this. They says, OK, we're not going to play, right? We're not going to play. So Abner Haynes said, now, don't let me go home and turn on TV and see you guys playing. And I think then the question was, was the AFL going to scold them, go ahead and play the game without them, or were they going to support their players? And to the AFL's credit, they stepped up and supported their players and moved the game to Houston. The fourth annual American Football League All-Star Game switched from New Orleans due to a racial incident attracts a slim crowd of only 15,000 to Jepson Stadium in Houston, Texas. Keith Lincoln takes a pitch out around the right side. The West blockers do a great job clearing the way. San Diego fullback steps off 80 yards to register another touchdown for the West. The actual game was no Super Bowl, and the walkout was no Selma. But the AFL player boycott had a lasting impact. I don't think that's ever been done before. I don't think there's a case of a boycott of a, of a professional sport by the players. And certainly athletes at that time were a privileged few enjoying benefits that very few other blacks enjoyed. And for this group of athletes to jeopardize that position, I took a lot of courage. To have done anything else would have been a slap in the face of some of the civil rights marchers who were giving up a lot more than what we had given up.
By 1965, America and the American Football League had come a long way. But there was still a long way to go. My general manager, Mr. Stedman, was telling me, well, Abner, we don't condone what you did in New Orleans. And we think you led them. They wrote me a letter, two-page letter, explaining to me how a football player's role is not to help his people. All I'm supposed to do is to play football and keep my mouth shut. Within two days, two or three days, I was traded to Denver. You'd be surprised how many were out of the game within a year or two. I know Cookie Gilchrist's career went down the drain after that. But I'm more concerned with being a good dad. And my son's not here and 20 and 30 years later, how I chickened out and didn't have no backbone. It was time for some men to stand up and be counted. I think that's what we did. In the jungles of Vietnam, about 40 miles north of Pleiku, men of the 101st Airborne Division, the screaming... Vietnam came from the deep background into the absolute peak of the foreground. During this same period, the AFL was growing, becoming more popular. When Tech Schramm talked about the war in the 60s, he wasn't referring to Vietnam. He was talking about the NFL and the AFL, and that was the war that these men were fighting. Now they were in a fight for survival, and they were going to succeed at all costs. The AFL needed every weapon at its disposal to wage war against the more powerful NFL. The spoils of this war included fan loyalty, television money, and draft choices. The battles were fought on several fronts, including outer space. It's December of 65, and the Gemini 7 mission is going on. Frank Borman and James Lovell are up in space, and as often happened then, when the astronauts were in space, they would occasionally beam a message back to American television. And Borman, who was an Oilers season ticket holder and a big Oilers fan, sent back the message, tell Tommy Nobis to sign with the Oilers of the AFL, because Tommy Nobis was the All-American linebacker for Texas, who was one of the plums of that year's draft class that both leagues were fighting over. Nobis would eventually touch down in the NFL. Touchdowns in the AFL often resulted when teams flew by the seat of their pants. In the new age of televised sports, the league's fan-friendly, fast-paced style of play helped pro football surpass baseball as America's favorite sport in 1965. Football became the national game. Without the ladder of television to stand on, that doesn't happen. The American Football League arose right at the time television and football got married. The AFL threw the ball, threw the ball a lot, moved the ball around a lot. And throwing the ball uh, and the excitement that that generated uh, made it automatic hit on television. In 1964, the AFL signed a new TV contract with NBC. The deal, which took effect in 1965, guaranteed each of the league's eight teams close to $1 million apiece. The NFL remained the more popular league, but in terms of TV revenue, the pact placed the rivals on near equal footing. That contract was very important because it gave us some sustainability. It frightened the hell out of the NFL. Art Modell said after that deal was signed by NBC, he knew the AFL was there to stay. And as Art Rooney, the owner of the Steelers, said, they don't have to call us Mr. anymore. David Sonny Werblin was instrumental in negotiating the NBC contract. 
In 1963, Werblin had purchased the bankrupt Titans from Harry Wismer. The Titans had been a laughing stock ever since the AFL began. Because they were so bad, it was like creative destruction, right, <laughs> in, in capitalism. They had to be destroyed. And something new had to rise up in New York, the most important market. New York's AFL franchise was renamed the Jets. The eccentric Wismer was unhappy about the prospect of losing his floundering team. He became even more unhappy when he learned that Sonny Werblin was a potential buyer. At 21 Club, my dad and uh, Harry Wismer had dinner. Commissioner Foss had expressed to Wismer that uh, my father and a group had interest in, in buying the Titans. Oh, I uh, expected a lot of people to be bidding, but it, the truth was that there was only one bidder, and that was Werblin. Harry Wismer, after a few cocktails, yelled an ethnic slur at my dad. My dad was about to go after him. That's when I said, stop it! And you know, we've had enough of this nonsense here. And my father said, I will own your team in one year. And did. In a sense, the history of the American Football League is the tale of two owners. Harry, who allowed this franchise to disintegrate, and Sonny Werblin. Sonny was the world's greatest talent agent. Came out of Rutgers during the Depression. He became a big band booker, you know, Benny Goodman, Glenn Miller, all these guys. After television came in, he was the agent for Gleason. Jackie Gleason, Ed Sullivan, and many of the biggest names in the entertainment business owed their television careers to Werblin. Werblin hired Weeb Eubank as head coach. In the NFL, Eubank had coached the Baltimore Colts to two world championships. One year after getting a new coach, the Jets got a new home. The millions who will visit the New York World's Fair in the next two years will also gaze on a glamorous new sports center, Shea Stadium. New York Cinderella football team, the Jets, take over the park next fall. Okay now, let's go Mets. Let's go, Jets. People get history wrong and say, oh, Jets, they named them because of the uh, New York Mets. But that's quite wrong. Sonny chose the name Jets because Shea Stadium was going to be between LaGuardia and Idlewild Airport. And we were entering the space or jet age. And that's how we got the name New York Jets. When we opened Shea Stadium, the World's Fair was still going on. The New York World's Fair has been visited by 51 million people and more than 52,000 fans throng to see the Jets open the 1964 AFL season against the Denver Broncos. There was so much traffic because of the World's Fair going on at the same time. People abandoned their cars on the Grand Central Parkway, actually closed off a lane to go to the, uh, to the game. Werblin's flair for promotion brought show business to Shea Stadium. He saw the game experience as being an entertainment experience, and that's why he hired this 100-piece Bob Cleveland orchestra. It used to play out in the end zone, created this little model jet that used to run up and down the sidelines. The largest opening day crowd in AFL history, 53,000 strong, swells Shea Stadium in New York City, 61,929. Count them. They fill the new park from top to bottom. Let's go, 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 Jets. Let's show them how to move that ball. Let's go, 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 Jets. The fighting green will beat them all. In one word, what he brought to professional football in this country is showmanship. The fate of the American Football League was determined in New York City for a lot of reasons. New York is the capital of advertising, of the was then the television networks, uh, publishing, the money, and it was also the home of New York Giants. The Giants were very glamorous and exciting, and the high-style people began to follow them and try to get into Yankee Stadium. The Giants definitely, at the time, had an elitist attitude and I think an image. I think a lot of people sort of resented that. 
and the Jets took the opposite approach of being a team for the blue collar worker, for the average Joe. The average Joe was starting to see an influx of above average young talent on the Jets. Fullback Matt Snell was drafted in 1964 and won Rookie of the Year honors. Snell had also been drafted by the Giants. His signing represented a significant victory against the Mara family, longtime Giants owners who embodied the entrenched NFL establishment. The contest between Harry Wismer and the Gentleman Maras was a mismatch made in NFL heaven. The contest between Sonny Werblin and the NFL was something quite different. One time, Wellington Mara saw all the attention that Jets were getting. He wrote a letter to the New York Times sports uh, editor complaining about the amount of space that the Jets were getting in the New York Times. It really showed that we had made an inroad into the scene of New York. I can't imagine him anywhere else but New York. Can you? Sonny Werblin? I mean, it was perfect. It was a match made in heaven, and I admired Sonny because he was going to take on one of the premier franchises in all the sports in the toughest town in America, and he beat him. What is it that has the fans flocking to cheer their favorite teams week after week? We asked American Football League Commissioner Joe Foss to give us the facts and figures on the attendance story and the reasons behind it. Here's what he had to say. This year in the American Football League, we've been real enthusiastic and happy with our attendance. To start out with, we started the 1965 season with a 54% increase on season ticket sales. The American Football League in 1965, as never before, has caught the imagination of the fans across the country with its wide open action and hotly contested games. We weren't going to run a three downs in a cloud of dust. People want to see the wide open game. In fact, we were a more wide open uh, football uh, league than the National Football League. Statistically speaking, there's no merit to the argument that the AFL had a more wide open brand of football. In fact, I would define the AFL as a sloppier, much lower quality brand of football, quite frankly. The number of interceptions in the AFL dwarfed the number of interceptions in the NFL. Not once in the decade of the 60s did AFL quarterbacks collectively average 50% completion percentage over the course of a season. Every year of the 60s, they failed to complete half their passes. Meanwhile, in the NFL, every year of the 60s, NFL quarterbacks completed more than half their passes. In every single year of the 1960s, NFL quarterbacks posted a higher completion percentage, a higher average gain per pass attempt, and a higher passer rating than AFL quarterbacks. In both leagues, they were consistently going down the field, this long ball, deep threat type of passing strategy where you're trying to stretch a defense vertically. We tend to attribute that to people like Al Davis. The NFL was just doing it better. Their quarterbacks were more accurate, their receivers were better, they were catching longer touchdown passes, they were doing it more consistently. During the 1960s, there were three 99-yard pass plays. All three were produced in the NFL, not the AFL. The NFL's popularity was based on a total package that included proficient passing, black and blue defense, and the power sweep. But the AFL's identity was built almost exclusively on high-scoring, up-tempo offense. When you look back at AFL stars, you know, you're thinking just generally of offensive players and specifically, you know, of speed and wide receivers and, and throwing the ball. Kansas City's Lynn Dawson, all-league quarterback, fires one to Otis Taylor, another one of the many thrilling performers in the star-studded AFL. drafted players and tried to sign players to sell tickets and so consequently I think that when you 
uh, talk about selling tickets, you want to get offensive players. As an example, Earl Faison was a very, very good defensive player that went to San Diego. I don't know how many tickets Faison sells. I do know that Lance Allworth sells a lot of tickets. Lance Allworth personified the AFL's image as an exciting pass-happy football league. Quarterback John Hagel and Allworth formed a potent pass-catch partnership. But in 1965, they weren't exactly household names. The New York Jets meet the Chargers at San Diego, and the home team takes charge. The Jets can't cope with the Charger combination of John Paddle and Lance Elworth. But for those who evaluated pro football talent, Allworth's name was synonymous with excellence. Lance Allworth was now the standard by which wide receivers in college were being compared. They would say, you'd say, to them, well, how about that wide receiver you have? What are his chances of playing? He said, hey, he's, he's probably as good as anybody in the NFL, but he's not at all worth. That was the first time that the standard of talent at any position in football was an AFL player. was destined to become the first AFL player to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Long pass. Lance Hallworth, the greatest receiver in pro football, takes the ball in stride and doesn't stop until he reaches the end zone. Other outstanding receivers included Denver's Lionel Taylor and New York's Don Maynard, a future Hall of Famer. Like Maynard and Taylor, Oakland's Art Powell had starred in the AFL since its inception. The league also boasted running backs who could catch the ball downfield. Denver's Abner Haynes excelled as a deep threat, as did the Raiders' Clem Daniels. During the mid-60s, Daniels was the driving force of Oakland's offense. Tom Flores passes. Clem Daniels has it, and he's going all the way. Man alive, what's this? He keeps on going. This is really wild. And Daniels now is really going to take charge. He's going to complete his run in a Chrysler Newport. What a play, and what a car. It's everybody's driving ambition. Big double O, Jim Otto is still running interference. Now he heads for his Plymouth. It's a fury. A fast, good-looking heavyweight with plenty of passing power. In 1964, passing power was a concern for Sonny Werblin's Jets. Werblin felt that starter Dick Wood lacked star quality. In one preseason game, the Jets owner hoped that former Titan Lee Grosscup would emerge as his marquee quarterback. Sonny and I walked to the stadium, and while we were walking, he said very quietly, he said, if Lee Grosscup has a good day today, I'm going to make him the highest paid athlete in America since Babe Ruth. And I looked at Sonny and I said, why? <laughs> I had played with Grosscup. His achievements were not Ruthian by any means. Now by Ron Neary, defensive end, causes Titan quarterback Lee Grosscup to throw a wobbly pass. And Sonny patiently explained that money can be news. Big money can be big news. Lee Grosskep didn't have a good day that day. But the point is that Sonny had a check looking for a quarterback. And eventually, the next April, he found the perfect quarterback. Watch number 12. That's Joe Namath. A standout at Alabama, Namath was courted by the Jets and the NFL Cardinals. Two representatives from the Cardinals came to my dormitory in University of Alabama, and we met up in my dorm room. And they told me they had drafted me, which I was aware of, and uh, asked me what I wanted to sign. And I told them $200,000, and they both 
lean back. Oh my goodness, you know, fell down on the bed. The guy was standing here and fell lean back against the wall, screaming like they were in agony. And after they calmed down a little bit, I said, there's one more thing. It's what? I said, a new car. They said, a new car too. I said, yeah. They said, what kind of car? I said, a Lincoln Continental. <laughs> my first meeting with David A. Sonny Werblin, Mr. Werblin, and Weeb Bank took place at the Beverly Hills Hotel. Not my dorm room, at the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles. Mr. Werblin started out, listen, I don't want to quibble over money. We want you. New York wants you. This is what I'm going to offer you. I want you to take it. $300,000 to play for the Jazz. I was only thinking of two to start with, right? This three hundred went up uh, a bit after we negotiated things. You know, uh, these people here, your future coach and the owner, Mr. Werblin, have uh, referred to you as the greatest football player in college this year. Uh, you haven't even put on a Jet uniform yet. Uh, you already feel a little bit of pressure? Well, uh, pressure just makes it go all the more. Uh -huh. I kind of like pressure a little bit. Mr. Werblin, you're the man that's given all this money. We don't know the exact figures, but... Uh, well, you're not going to know it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, how, 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 what kind of an estimate or what uh, can you tell us about it? Well, Bob, all I can say is that we think it's, it's a lot of money, but it's commensurate with uh, his ability. All of a sudden, they're giving this guy $400,000. Well, you know, it was a ridiculous amount of money. But it did get you looking, didn't it? I mean, it, it really put the AFL on the map. I think it was probably the smartest $400,000 that they ever spent in sports. Well, I doubt if anybody's worth $400,000 right out of college, but uh, I think Joe Namath's going to be a fine quarterback. Joe Namath, the Jets' $400,000 quarterback, passes to Bill Mathis. Joe Namath, the world's richest rookie, backpedals and takes to Bake Turner. It seems to be pretty much the general consensus that he has all those qualities that quarterbacks need to not only last long in pro football, but achieve success. Throws a good, firm ball. He has quick release, which seems to be one of the qualities that every coach is looking for in his quarterback. Courage under fire was another quality that Namath possessed. Well, any defensive lineman on any team likes to hit a quarterback because the quarterback gets hit less than anybody else. And so when they do hit him, uh, it gives him an extra bit of pleasure, you know. We, we played the Boston Patriots, and I picked up the safety blitz right on my butt. I couldn't even sit down. It hurt so bad. I, I got home, and I took the worst tasting stuff I could find, scotch. And I drank it for five years. <laughs> Although hampered by gimpy knees, Namath had guts to go along with his gunslinger reputation. It was Namath's heart, as well as his arm, that made him a commanding box office draw. Namath, Namath's magic, especially in New York, where record numbers are turning out, hoping to see the former Alabama star. Seldom does an athlete come along who electrifies a crowd like Namath. Off the field, Broadway Joe's brash charm and charisma won the heart of New York City. Werblin's skill for star making help Namath the natural quarterback become Namath the national celebrity. Sonny Werblin is the man who made Joe Namath Broadway Joe. It just fit and he loved it. He was comfortable. He was a bachelor. He had that smile. You know, I mean, every girl in America loved him, you know, and he just, he just went along for the ride. There was a look about him uh, that women absolutely loved, and he had a great smile and great eyes. He also not only reached the men who thought of him as macho, but women. Thanks to Namath's magnetism, the Jets and the AFL enlarged their national profile. Preseason games were then called exhibition games, and the Jets played all six of theirs on the road. They visited cities like Scottsdale, Arizona, and Richmond, Virginia. In Allentown, PA, they played two years in a row, and Namath won new fans for the AFL. I remember walking into the stadium for a practice session, and the first thing I saw as I walked in was Joe Namath and Don Maynard playing catch out on the field. And, and the two players were, were standing there throwing passes probably 20 or 30 yards away from each other. And the first pass I saw Namath through, 
he skidded the ball about halfway between he and Don Maynard. And as the ball skidded, it came up and hit Maynard in the letters in a tight spiral. And remember, the friends and I looked at each other and said, did he want to do that? Well, the next three or four passes, he did the same thing. He was throwing the ball, skidding it about 15 yards away, and for the next 15 yards, it would come up and hit Maynard in the letters. And we were like, can you believe this guy can do this at will? In 1965, Namath was the AFL Rookie of the Year. Two years later, he became the first quarterback in history to pass for over 4,000 yards. Broadway Joe Namath and Sonny Werblin, the leading man and the impresario. Together, they helped change the fortunes of the American Football League. The NFL was trying to kill us. I mean, they were trying to put the AFL out of business. And Mr. Werblin, he made Broadway Joe the thing to get people to come to the stadium to see Joe. Mr. Werblin, being in show business, believed in the star system. He believed in filling the stands, putting people on the field that the fans could relate to, or they wanted to come see special, the star system. Mr. Werblin allowed his team, especially me, to be myself, and it was in the fishbowl in New York. You know, it was wonderful. In the fierce fight for college players, the NFL created a program known as Operation Handholding to ensure draft day superiority over the AFL. That's the name I got there. Operation Handholding was put into effect by Pete Rosell. A handholder was an individual that was assigned to a player. His duty was to keep that player out of contact with somebody from the American Football League. Basically, the idea was to remove the player from his residence, put him under NFL control, and hold him there until you get him signed. That way, the AFL could not reach these players, the NFL would be able to control until they got the name on the dotted line. I had a limousine that to take me anywhere and, and whenever I wanted to go to uh, lunch, dinner or whatever and I mean it was just royal treatment and I just thought they were being nice but I figured it out as time went on that uh, you know I wasn't getting any calls from anybody from the AFL. <laughs> they weren't allowing any calls to come through I guess but uh, I found out that the other league was trying to get in touch with me and NFL did a pretty good job of keeping me away from the other league. Atlanta selects Tommy Nobis. Roselle was the puppet master with all of that, and we didn't have that kind of central control. So we, in Oakland, we just went out and did what we had to do, and we used money. I mean, no one had agents in those days. I remember one player, I won't tell you his name, but I, I was in a motel room with him trying to sign him, and I had an attache case with $5,000 in, in greenbacks in it, and he was getting close to signing, I knew. So I said, wait a minute, and I took all those greenbacks and I laid them out on the bed. It just covered that bed from top to bottom. And he got a phone, on the phone with his wife and said, honey, you just can't believe what this man put on the bed. And that signed him. No agents, cash. There was a great deal of intrigue here, a great deal of spy versus spy, a great deal of counter espionage that was a, an imitation to some level of the Cold War that was going on in the real world at that time. The subterfuge, the deceit that was used on, on both sides was considerable. To sign receiver Otis Taylor, the Chiefs outmaneuvered the Cowboys in a scenario worthy of Mission Impossible. Otis was in a Holiday Inn in Richardson, Texas, being guarded by the NFL um, babysitters. And meanwhile, uh, a fellow by the name of Lloyd Wells, uh, who worked for Kansas City and uh, Hank Stram, was able to somehow find where we had him sequestered. Lloyd was trying to figure out some way to get word to Otis Taylor. And at one point, he posed as a photographer for Jet Magazine and got in to Otis's room to take some pictures. And the message he communicated then to Otis was very simple. It was, if you don't get out of this hotel and come with me, I am going to lose my damn job. 
And what took place is, is that our fella, Wally Reed, probably had a little too much liquid libation and fell asleep. And while Wally Reed slept, Taylor left. They went out the window, is what they did. In this element that this battle was being conducted, there, there really were no rules. The rules were whoever signs the most good players, well-known players, wins. In the 12th round of the 64 draft, the Bills selected an immigrant refugee of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution who would revolutionize pro football. Pete Goglak was different because a soccer-style kicker had never kicked before in pro football. His foot hand coordination was unbelievable, but how explosive that ball was when it kicked off. I mean, he could kick it over the line, never worry about it getting blocked. Goglak was really a novelty, the soccer style kicker. You know, Blanda threw passes, Gino Capaletti, guys like that that really had two jobs, not just one. You know, he was, I think, right at the forefront of the term specialist. He was on that team for one reason, and that was to kick the ball. When he came along as a kicking specialist and could kick soccer style, the percentages went from 60 to 80 or in that neighborhood. Kicking became much more of an offensive weapon than it had ever been before. Even today, I don't know how they get that ball airborne, kicking it like they do. I just can't envision them doing that, but, but they do. They developed a, a knack uh, to do it, and uh, there are no straight-on kickers anymore, so it, it didn't take many years that uh, they just replaced all of the head-on kickers. Kick on its way, and over it. Does it have the distance it is? Good! Good. Lawrence Tynes has kicked the Giants to the Super Bowl! I should have patented this kick. You know, when I started, I get a good patent lawyer. So everybody after after me, every time somebody goes in and kick, you know, give me a quarter, at least a quarter. <laughs> this is, you know, this is kind of a gogo like style. I think the fact that Gogolak and, and the Bills, we first played for, got people to look at that style. It was so revolutionary. That, I think, is really something the AFL deserves credit for. For having the open mind to go deviate so far from the accepted norm, because that did have a material impact how football was played. I think it's symbolic what we want to believe about the AFL, that it was more innovative. Gogolak's influence would soon extend beyond the playing field, becoming the spark that ignited a talent war between the rival leagues. There's been an awful lot of rumors. Uh, right now, uh, they claim that uh, the National Football League and the American Football League might merge into three conferences. Well, our main concern right now in the NFL is making it as uh, strong as possible, and we haven't given thought to anything else, really. What about a championship game between the NFL and the AFL? Well, I would say the same answer. <laughs> We're just, uh, we, we've been in litigation for over three and a half years with the American Football League, and there hasn't been much opportunity to think of anything beyond our own league. It's still years away. <laughs> Pete Rozelle's public pronouncements belied the real concerns he shared with the NFL's owners about the AFL. The college talent bidding wars had bloated operating costs and a growing number of teams were coming around to the idea of a settlement with the rival league. They had a great deal of tenacity, those people that formed the AFL. And during the 1966 season, I think, I'd had some discussions with Tex Schramm and uh, also with other owners in the league. And I got the feeling that a merger might be possible and that if it were to be accomplished, it would be best be through discussions with Tex, who lived in Dallas, and Lamar Hunt, who felt a man of honor, he would be good to talk to and keep it confidential. I knew something was going on because I asked Tex uh, a question, and, and he said, gosh, he said, I just can't do that this weekend. I'm going to the Pimlico racetrack. Tex is not a horse race fan. And so I knew that I was getting some kind of an excuse, and uh, little did I know that he and Lamar were meeting at the Love Field. We met by the Texas Ranger statue in, in the lobby of Love Field Airport. The whole world could see us there meeting. The reason for the going out and meeting in the parking lot was that I was on my way to Houston and uh, for an AFL meeting the next day. And incidentally, it was the meeting where Joe Foss resigned and he was replaced by Al Davis. The combative Davis would be the AFL's wartime commissioner. 
ironically replacing a man who'd actually been a decorated war hero in the retiring Joe Foss. And so in 1966, the great rivalries continued. The great new stars who came into the American Football League in 1965. The owners wanted somebody who would legally or I'm not sure I want to use the word illegally, but do whatever it took to not only bring the AFL to parity with the NFL, but overtake it. And Al Davis was probably the one person whom they knew could do it. Davis bided his time until Pete Gogolak and Giants owner Wellington Mara made a fateful agreement. Back in the old country, they said, you know, if you do well, you know, you can ask for you. You can be ashamed to ask for a raise. But the Bills wouldn't give it to me. So I became a free agent, and the Giants signed me. I didn't realize that this really created a war between the two leagues. And there was an unwritten rule that we wouldn't sign each other's free agents. And the Giants and the National Football League, through its commissioner, broke the rule. The unwritten rule. It wasn't illegal by any means. The Gogol Act signing was unfathomable to the other NFL owners. They couldn't understand why Mara did that. Mara reacted because all the stuff that was going on in New York about Namath and the $400,000, the Giants were in trouble. So he thought signing Gogol Act would help him. And one of those owners, it might have been Carol Rosenblum of the Colts, who said, if you wanted a kicker, I'd have given you one. I'll never forget sitting there with Ralph Wilson that day. And I said to him, we just got a merger. And he said to me, what do you mean by that, you know? And you didn't ask Ralph. And I said, we just got a merger. Just watch what happens. An avid student of military history, Davis applied those lessons to launch his campaign against the NFL. It was a great quote from Aldo Cassell, longtime Raider executive. He said, uh, the NFL uh, uh, fired a shot with a revolver, and Al Davis responded with a machine gun. And that's exactly what he did. He went out, he said, all bets are off, and they went out and they began signing NFL players to future contracts with the American Football League. All the AFL needed to do was sign a few stars, and they were going to, as Davis put it, bring the NFL to its knees. Davis wanted to go particularly strong after players on the Los Angeles Rams. This was Al's mindset. Pete Rozelle had come into the league as a publicity director for the Los Angeles Rams. One of his oldest friends was Dan Reeves, the owner of the Rams. And Davis felt like if he got players from the Rams to sign with the AFL, Reeves would pressure his friend for an accommodation. Al's opening assault was to have the Raiders sign Rams quarterback Roman Gabriel to a contract. They knew that we could destroy their league. We could hold the Rams hostage because most of their players wanted to leave. And it was a preliminary strike to let them know what's going to happen if they continue this. Al's exit strategy was not a merger. Al's exit strategy was take them on, become their equals, then become better than them. Davis's most important ally in the NFL raids was in Houston. Boiler ownership's aggressive attitude and deep pockets advanced the new commissioner's strategy. Bud Adams was a, I know, take your tie off, roll your sleeves up, and let's have a beer and maybe a chaser to go with it and talk a deal. And people like Bud Adams, they also had the oil man's mentality, which was risk, gamble, go big or go home. That picture brings back fond memories of the 1960 championship game of the American football. Adams struck a gusher when he targeted the Chicago Bears, stealing their all-pro tight end, Mike Ditka. I called Mike up and I said, Mike, I'd like to have you come down and become an order. He said, you couldn't pay me enough money. Uh, but he says, you know how much I make up here? He said, I make $125,000. You couldn't pay anything like that. I said, Mike, how would you like to make $250,000? He said, what do I have to do? <laughs> so I said, all you have to do is play out your option. Adams then moved quickly to sign San Francisco's John Brody, the NFL's leading passer. This time, give me that, tuck, give me that eight yard out. Red right pattern, 55, X pinch release, half back out, on one, ready for... Streak it, G. 
Brody signed a million dollar deal with Houston, rocking the NFL to its core. League owners feared more player defections were still to come. They were rating our quarterbacks, they were rating our stars, and we were going back and rating theirs. You can't operate a business that way. And it was just the whole thing was coming apart. If there was going to be a peace, it was going to have to be on our terms. If we were having problems, their league was doubling those or tripling those, even though they had a television contract. It's amazing how sometimes the objective can become important enough to overcome some of your real strong inner feelings. The agreement called for a common college draft and championship game in 1967, with full merger into one league by 1970. The players who jumped to the AFL returned to their original teams. After seven hard-fought years, the Foolish Club was a legitimate member of the NFL fraternity. Within a 48-hour period, from the time the merger was announced, the stock of the Patriots, Patriots evaluated $3,100,000 on the open market. AFL teams welcomed that financial windfall since part of the merger agreement required them to pay millions of dollars in reparations to NFL clubs. But that wasn't what most angered Al Davis. He felt he was undercut because Hunt and Tech Schramm cut a merger deal behind his back. The last guy they told about the merger was Davis. And when he found out, he was really pissed off. He said, we had him whipped. There's no reason we had to settle for any of the things we did. We had him whipped. I've always said that the uh, generals win the war, but the politicos, the politicians, make the peace. There was so much bitterness, so much acrimony. The tension in the room was really amazing. You couldn't imagine these people actually being in the same room. The National Football League guys were all on one side. The American Football League people were all on the other side. It was as if you walked into the room and there was an usher standing there saying, friends of the groom, friends of the brides, and everybody just went to the seven ways. Uh, who does this panel think won the war? Who won the war? I feel that the league matters. <laughs> the big news after the merger was the launching of expansion teams into southern cities. The AFL's new entry was in Miami, the home base of a young radio talk show host named Larry King. I worked at WIOD in Miami. I did a nightly radio show from Surfside 6, the houseboat that was a very famous television show. And they let us use that boat for our radio show. So we were docked opposite the Fontainebleau on the inland waterway. Many great guests would come stay at the Fontainebleau and come across the street. And along come Danny Thomas and this group. And they bring the Miami Dolphins. The Miami Dolphins come to town. Amid all the bright lights and pretty girls that are synonymous with Miami, Florida, the American Football League kicks off the 1966 season, spotlighting its newest team, the Miami Dolphins. Danny was had maybe 1% of the team. Joe Robbie put the whole package together. I've been enormously impressed uh, the entire time I've been in Miami with the uh, enthusiasm of the football fan. Three of the top Joe was a genius of sorts. He had no money of his own. He once ran for governor of South Dakota, almost won. Very big in Democratic Party politics. Operating on a tight budget and with almost no lead time to assemble the team, the Dolphins scramble to publicize their new players while making the best of bad training camp facilities. St. Petersburg was not the place for a pro football team to train. They had no idea what was going on. We did not have a locker room. I don't know if we, we changed and did everything in our rooms. So after a couple of weeks in your room, it got a little bit gamey. We practiced on a field that was at one of the local junior highs or high school there, which was, I mean, had seashells on the field, and it wasn't even a football field. They just marked it off as like a part of a beach area almost. The playing surface at the Orange Bowl was a much faster track. As the Dolphins and their celebrity co-owner discovered the night of the first game in franchise history. Enjoying every moment of opening night is comedian Danny Thomas, co-owner along with Joseph Robbie. Looks like Danny knows his football. The Dolphins' debut must go down in football history as the most thrilling first play ever made by any new team anywhere. 
Joe Auer from nearby Coral Gables High School and a Georgia Tech alumnus takes the opening kickoff and races 95 yards for a touchdown. Joe Auer took the opening kickoff and Danny Thomas ran down the sidelines with him. As he ran, Danny ran. Many years later, Johnny Carson asked him for his most memorable moment, and he said, well, the most memorable moment in his career uh, was when Joe Auer ran the opening kickoff of the Miami Dolphin franchise back for a touchdown. And God, I sat up in bed and went, did I just hear my name on the Johnny Carson show? The 66 Dolphins won just three games, and even those were witnessed by only a handful of Florida fans who stayed away from the Orange Bowl in droves, putting Miami's cash-strapped ownership in a deep financial hole. If certain players tell us in town here, and we hear from other people who've, who have done business all year with the Dolphins, that they've been waiting on the money that's owed them to this day. Now, is that a rumor? There's never, been a, there's never been a player that hasn't been paid on time since this team went in business. I was sent to pick up the projector at the repair place, and I had to pay for it with my own money because they wouldn't let me. The Dolphins didn't have good enough credit. They wouldn't bill the Dolphins, and I had to pay for it with my own money. And uh, one time, the dry cleaners that cleaned our uniform held our uniforms up. Laundry was the least of Coach George Wilson's worries. When three of his quarterbacks were injured, he was forced to use the team punter, who also happened to be his son. George Wilson Jr. was a nice guy. He wasn't the picture athlete. He looked more like a uh, college professor or maybe one of the trainers or something. I mean, he didn't look like a football player. That was always the pressure was put on George Wilson's father about his son. His son was a good player, not a great player. Whenever he started his son, they lost. The fans would go nuts. Which George, the fans gave George a tough time. The press gave him a tough time. He started to drink, but he was a guy's guy. George Wilson was a real player coach. And I remember one time during training camp, we'd had a really bad practice, and he had us line up and started marching us around the playing field, you know, and I thought, God, I've never seen anything like this. He ended up marching us right into the uh, swimming pool at St. Andrews with our uniforms on and everything. And it ended up being, you know, one of these funny things that everybody just had a blast doing. Cooling off in the pool was a regular activity for Flipper, the team mascot in his end zone water tank. Being an expansion team, you needed a lot of things to perhaps draw people into it. And Flipper was very popular at that time. He would throw the footballs back out, you know, our field goals and extra points when it was going to the end zone. So Flipper was cool. Whenever the Dolphins score, Flipper would go up and jump through the hoop. They decided they didn't score enough, so he would jump up on first downs. We made a first down, flip the jump. Although points and victories were rare, the Dolphins reveled in being part of something new, just as the AFL's pioneers did when the league began. We were a bunch of cast-offs and rookies and people had that were in the uh, twilight of their career, all patched together in one place. We all were very cognizant of the fact that this may be our only or last chance. So it, it had a certain spirit and a certain friends and family feel to it that was very important and very memorable. Thanks to the merger deal, the AFL's head coaches could now compete for a seat at the newly created banquet table first ever opportunity to face the NFL's best in a world championship game. Yes, I'm hungry for those good things, baby. I'm hungry to and true. Well, I'm hungry for that sweet life, baby. A real fine girl like you. By season's end, it was the Kansas City Chiefs sporting the biggest appetite gobbling up their opponents on their way to the AFL title. This game was being put together called the Super Bowl. And I thought the Super Bowl was going to be fantastic, except the name was corny. <laughs> proved to be the opposite. 
I think where it really came from probably is that my wife had given our three children at that time, each of them a super ball. It was a child's toy. You could literally bounce on concrete and it would bounce over a house. And the Super Bowl under the table return. Super Bowl made only by Wemo. No one ever said, let's have a bunch of market research to try to figure out a name. It was purely accidental. The press seized on it. It was great for us to be the first team to be in the first Super Bowl game because Lamar Hunt founded the American Football League. You realize that every player, every person, secretary, everybody in the American Football League felt that you were representing the whole league in this game. It wasn't just Kansas City. It was the whole league. The standard bearers of the status quo would be the Green Bay Packers, led by their iconic coach. Let's move a little bit now. Let's go. Let's get ourselves ready here. Wellington Maris sat down and he wrote a letter to Vince Lombardi. In this letter, he said, you are our leader and you are our standard bearer, and I can't think of anybody else as well-equipped to carry our flag in the battle. Now, that sounds ridiculous today, but you had to understand the mood of these people. And it was really on Coach Lombardi's back to beat them and beat them badly and embarrass them if he could. I think the NFL would have liked to have seen a 60 to nothing score. That would have made them happy. We were known as a Mickey Mouse League, I guess. But I can recall, I think it might have been in the locker room that guys were wearing those Mickey Mouse hats around to break the seriousness of the game coming up because here we are, you know, a new league coming here, playing the great Vince Lombardi and his Green Bay Packers are a powerhouse team. So they were looking for some outside thing to take away the tension rather than take that tension and use it and make it work for you, make you want to destroy people and, 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 and kill people. They were looking for something to minimize the tension, and I, I thought that was the wrong approach. Williamson made pass catchers regret their receptions with a trademark wallop that had earned him his nickname. The hammer was a blow struck perpendicular to the Earth's latitude. Watch Fred Williamson and his famous hammer tackle upset Quilly. That, per se, is the hammer. It's like running dark in somebody's backyard and all of a sudden the clothesline hits you. The clothesline grabs you around the neck, the head stops, but the body keeps moving. It catches you right around the throat of the head and uh, I tell you, it really shakes you up. But what I was trying to do was let the players know the attitude that got them here is the same attitude that's going to help win this game. He starts spouting off what he was going to do uh, to the receivers of the Green Bay Packers. And I can recall the other defensive guys said, Freddie, geez, be quiet, man. You're killing us because, you know, you got their attention now. Now it's really going to be tough to play against them. He was ahead of his time. He's like a Muhammad Ali, that he was not afraid to voice his opinion. Back in the 60s, most of the time the players didn't do that. The inflammatory language continued at a pregame party that was supposed to be a friendly gathering between the two leagues. The evening wore on and the champagne flowed. One of the wives of one of the owners of the AFL made her way to the microphone and made a little short speech. And it started off innocently enough, but then at the very end she said, and there's just one thing I want to say in closing, and that is, go Chiefs, go. Bad taste. She didn't mean she didn't mean any harm, but it came off pretty bad. In fact, the NFL owners walked out. And you knew what was going through their minds was, oh, my God, what if we lose that game Sunday? Is this what we're going to have to put up with the rest of our lives? This match between the champs of the two leagues came about much sooner than anyone expected. But it's here, and it's here to stay, and it's always the first one that seems to be the most fun and the most remembered. Hank Stram's Chiefs were two touchdown underdogs, but didn't play like one in a closely contested first half. As Dawson calling signals on first down, keeps to the ball, rolls out to the right, he's got a man clear, touchdown! We looked down our nose at the AFL. We probably didn't respect them enough. And I'll guarantee at halftime, with four, at 14 to 10, there was a newfound respect for the Kansas City Chiefs, and I think that's when guys sort of got to play in the second half. They played much better. Dawson being rushed and thrown. And down the sidelines comes Willie Wood. Only one man can get him at the 10 and drags him down at the four-yard line. A big break. And that 
that changed the whole mood of the game. The attitude of the players just went like that because they figured they were going to score and there's no way we could, we could win. Three unanswered Green Bay touchdowns put the game out of reach as the old guard NFL got the blowout win it had hoped for. With just minutes remaining, the Packers added one final indignity when Fred the Hammer Williamson was knocked unconscious after making a tackle. What I can really remember is all the guys on the Green Bay Packers side hooting and a hollering at the hammer saying, get up, hammer, get up, hammer, do something, hammer. And I mean, they got on his case bad. And I, I'm thinking, oh, how embarrassing. The hammer, the hammer. You know who got hurt? The hammer. The hammer got hurt. The female hammer. Hey, slap, the hammer got it. He would tell you he wasn't knocked out. He was just waiting to hear the reaction of the fans when they heard his number that he was down. It seemed to be a fitting end to the story of the hammer. All the conversation with all the loud mouth, all the promotion, and to have this guy leave the field on a stretcher was poetic justice. Perfect. I thought Green Bay was a superior team. They had regularly beaten every team in the National Football League, and uh, it was apparent after the game that we weren't up to their caliber at that point. Lombardi said in the locker room, prodded, I admit, by the reporters, but he said in the locker room what all of us in the NFL wanted to hear. I think the Kansas City team is a real top football team. It doesn't compare with the National Football League teams. That's what you want me to say, I said it. <laughs> and the only thing that I would have asked Lombardi to say is that the Chiefs aren't as good as any of the teams in the NFL, but he wouldn't go that far. When Lombardi gave us no respect at all, that ticked me off, ticked all of us off. The second half, we just fell apart, but we know how well they can play. We knew that we just blew the chance, so we'll be back. We we're pretty confident. I did feel that some of us didn't play as well as we could for whatever reasons, and uh, I was not happy with that. Older players for Kansas City, because they are more of the history of the league, and when they lost that, it hurt them for other reasons than it hurt me that it was more personal and the world was probably ending for him. Super Bowl I, the first ever meeting between the NFL champion and the AFL champion was a sparsely attended affair. Sir, looks as time goes in the end zone. Great catch by Mac McGee. Off one hand. As expected, the NFL champion, Vince Lombardi's Green Bay Packers, won in a rout. After it was over, the AFL champion, Kansas City Chiefs, tried to put a good face on a lopsided loss. I thought we played well the first half, and I thought we got off to a good start the second half. They have good people. We had good people. We didn't play our finest ball game. They played well. In the Packers' locker room, the spin was slightly different. My most vivid memory was the press conference with Coach Lombardi standing up there, the commissioner giving him the trophy, and then the press immediately jumped to him with the obvious question, all right, Coach, tell us the truth. Were the Kansas City Chiefs better than the other NFL teams? I think the Kansas City team is a real top football team. It doesn't compare with the National Football League teams. That's what you want me to say, I said it. <laughs> When Lombardi said that the AFL wasn't in the NFL's class, someone came running back over to Stram and said, Henry, Henry, did you hear what Lombardi just said? Henry, what is your response to that? To which Stram responded, my response is, I'd like to take this bleep bleep program and bleep 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 bleep. The Chiefs didn't have to wait long to vent their frustrations on the older league. In the summer of 1967, AFL and NFL teams would meet for the first time in exhibition games. The Chiefs prepared for a matchup with the storied Chicago Bears. Mr. Rosell, what are your reactions and thoughts on this uh, interleague play between the AFL and NFL? Well, I think it's served as a tremendous uh, stimulus to our season. Actually, we have 16 such games, including uh, the one tomorrow night. 
We had no respect at that particular time. We were the other league. So there was a tremendous amount of pressure on us to do well in that football game. Further stoking the Chiefs' ire was a piece of NFL propaganda. The Chiefs had seen the NFL film's highlight of Super Bowl I in the days before their preseason game against the Bears. The screenplay for that film, as I understand it, had been written by Tex Maul at Sports Illustrated, who was close friends with Roselle and certainly an NFL loyalist. Dawson learns the hard way what NFL quarterbacks have known for years. Kansas City did have some stars, but Green Bay was a team of stars. As the game wore on, the Kansas City defensive line folded under the steady pounding of the Green Bay blockers. The Chiefs were helpless to stem the Packer onslaught. On another day in another year, it will surely be the turn of the AFL, but this spectacle of a sport belonged to Green Bay. The theme of that show was pretty much someday the AFL might come of age, but right now it can't really compete with the more superior National Football League. And the Chiefs players had been hearing about it, and so they came out for that game loaded for bear. I do remember my rookie year. That was the first home game that I played in. I was so amazed that here we were in an exhibition game, and everybody was so emotional. Tom Bettis, I remember, in a, in, a, in a defensive meeting, almost had tears in his eyes. So they were out to prove something, and, and they sure did. Kansas City is playing an NFL team for the first time since their Super Bowl loss to Green Bay. The final score was not to their liking, but not nearly as unpleasant as the comments that followed downgrading AFL football. In the minds of many, the Chiefs are out for revenge, and this is their first real shot. The Bears had heard about Kansas City's play-action passes, but couldn't stop them. Lim Dawson, with plenty of time, fires to Otis Taylor. They were absolutely dominant. Shut down Gale Sayers. Unleashed everything they could offensively. Reverses. The Chiefs are showing the Bears a type of offense they haven't seen before and hope not to encounter again. Flanker Otis Taylor on a razzle-dazzle run for 32 yards. It was good to see some payback. The Chiefs had the, the pony war paint. Every time they scored a touchdown, the pony would run around the, the track, around the stadium. And uh, at one point, when it was like 58 to 7, Hillis said, you've just about killed that horse. Don't you think you've scored enough? Kansas City defeated Chicago 66 to 24. To this day, it remains the worst defeat a George Hallis coach team ever suffered and the most points the Chiefs ever scored in a single game. Winning the Bear game like we did and as impressively as we did uh, uh, removed some of the scar tissue that, with, that existed from the loss of the, to the Green Bay Packers. The Chiefs were not the only AFL team to beat the NFL that preseason. The Broncos' win was significant because the Lions were considered a contender. And Alex Curtis was the captain of that team, and he was ranting and raving about he'll never allow an NFL team to beat a National League football team. If the Denver Broncos beat him, he walked back to Detroit. The Broncos were not one of the dominant teams in the AFL. They were more or less hapless. In many ways, the evolution of the Denver Broncos symbolized the American Football League's long struggle for respectability. Their uniform colors were no longer a source of ridicule. Their socks no longer had stripes. But still, they struggled to get their footing. In their first eight years of existence, they finished in last place six times. In 1967, their head coach was one of the AFL's legendary personalities, Lou Saban. There comes a time when you uh, gain the respect of the people you play against, and the people within the league. So just remember one thing, that you are on your way to be a winner. The optimistic view is that of Lou Saban, new head coach of the Denver Broncos. Saban's job is to redeem the Broncos' lowly estate in the American Football League. Saban never did turn the Broncos into a winner, but he did inject life in a franchise thought to be dead. If I had a bad team, I would, and it was a football team, I'd have Lou Saban coach it, start it. If it was a baseball team, I would have had Billy Martin. I think they were kind of the same guy. 
Martin and Saban had at least one trait in common. Temper. What the hell? Hey, what is it? It seemed like Lou was always mad. What the hell's the matter with you guys? My daughter could do better. My daughter could. Your chicken. I tell you, it's going to cost better, Key. And it's going to cost better, Key. Tell you. Better, Key. They're playing a preseason game. Denver kicks off, and the other team runs a kickoff back for a touchdown. Lou fired the whole kickoff team. All 11 guys, everyone on that, as they came off the field, you fired, you cut, you cut, you cut. They're killing me, why are they killing me? So we'll Lou Saban and wanted anybody trying out for the team guys. to join the National Three Guard. Family. Otherwise, they were going to get cut because he didn't want to put a player on a roster and then lose them uh, to the service. Unfortunately, some of those players that never made the team were in the National Guard. The next summer, they had to come up to serve their duty. Well, I gotta get the world off of my back. Oh, pretty soon I'm gonna crack. As hostilities grew around the country, the AFL became a place where angry men could always find a home. Prior to Denver, Saban was the first coach of the Patriots. He then became a two-time AFL champion with the Bills. In Buffalo, he coached one of the game's most outspoken players, Cookie Gilchrist. Cookie came to Buffalo after seven years in Canada, where he was a one-man show, starring at running back, linebacker, even kicker. Cookie Gilchrist kicks off short to Keith Beard, who is tackled by Gilchrist and Billy Graham on the Bombers' 32-yard line. In his first year in Buffalo, he became the first AFL player to rush for more than 1,000 yards. But by the end of his third season, he had worn out his welcome. Saban traded him to Denver for running back Billy Joe. And in true Gilchrist style, he went out to Denver. He said, I'm going to show you how much better I am than Billy Joe. Billy Joe wore number three. I'm going to wear number two and show you that I'm one better. Billy Joe countered that in Buffalo, where uh, Gilchrist wore number 34. Joe took number 33 for his uniform. Probably the thing that fascinated me most about Cookie is that he liked to say that what made him so effective is that he was relaxed before a game. The reason he was relaxed is he insisted on having sex right before a game. One time I asked him, Cookie, is it true that you have sex right before the game? And he said it was. And I said, is anybody else there? The major reason behind Denver's vault into second place in the rushing department was the acquisition of powerful fullback Cookie Gilchrist from the Buffalo Bills. Although the two-time ground-gaining champion got off to a slow start, he barely missed winning another title. He could run the ball. I think he was better than Jimmy Brown, but he never got the credit. Brown had power and finesse and mobility. I don't think Cookie had that finesse as far as making tackles miss him, but Cookie had more power than Brown. Cookie would, would run right over a tackler. Cookie was a great football player. Uh, a phenom. I had a lot of respect for his ability. Who gets compared to me and all of that, I care less about. You know, I don't compare a rose to a petunia, you know. They both have their own kind of beauty. It all depends on what you prefer. Cookie lasted just one year in Denver. He then played one season in Miami. He then returned to Denver to be coached by the man who traded him out of Buffalo. Of course, bouncing from place to place was nothing new to the AFL. She's a little bit funky. A little bit mean. She came running out of the stands and she ran up, and nobody bothered to stop her. And she runs out on the field. And she goes over to the officials and she wants the game ball. And she's trying to get the game ball and they're keeping the game ball away from her. But they're not trying to chase her off or holler for anybody else. Then she runs over to Don Floyd of the order, gives him a big hug and a kiss. Man, that girl is bad. Still nothing has happened. And everybody is standing around and staring, and the announcers can't believe what's going on. 
now she goes back across and goes up into the stands and sits down where she was before. And the game goes on. <laughs> Unbelievable. Baby, don't you know? AFL players came in all shapes and sizes. Jim Nance, the Boston Patriots 240-pound fullback, was a two-time rushing champion and the 1966 Player of the Year. The league's smallest player was the Chiefs' primary kick returner and reserve flanker, Nolan Supermat Smith. Nolan, you're not a giant among giants out here. How much opportunity did you get to play in, in college as a flanker? Well, none until my senior year. And uh, after uh, flanker graduated, well, I had to move into flanker, and I was in the team leading score from this flanker position. Supernat expressed himself a little better in the open field. His 106-yard kickoff return against the Broncos still stands as the longest return in Chiefs history. The trouble for Supernat was when he got caught. Defenders enjoyed swatting him down. Fortunately for the Chiefs, they also had the league's biggest player, Ernie Ladd. The big cat was always ready to deliver payback. Ladd displayed remarkable self-restraint when it came to running down the AFL's golden boy with the feeble knees, Joe Namath. Ernie stood about 6'10", 6'9", 300 and change. I'm going back to pass. Ernie came clean. Ernie knocks me down. My helmet's turned around sideways. I'm looking through the side of the hole. Ernie's helping me up now. He says, hey, don't worry, Broadway. I'm not going to hurt you. I'll hit you high. <laughs> I'm seeing gold flashes and everything. Ladd was a defensive giant, but he wished to be king of a different arena. Pro wrestling. Pro wrestling was, you know, that, that was almost a sport back then. They were quite the entertainer. Joining Ladd in the pro wrestling ranks was fellow AFL player, Native American Wahoo McDaniel. Watch him sweat. He's better than the rest. One year at a training camp, I went and wrestled Gene Kanishka for the World Championship five days after we were in camp. And drove back and got up the next morning and ran and scrimmaged another hour. Ernie, of course, towered over everybody in the ring and Wahoo would go in there and, and get beat up for, you know, seven or eight minutes and then go into his Indian war dance and pin the guy and win. He don't take no mess. It was very entertaining. So those are, you know, two of the AFL players that probably made a bigger name in the ring than they did on the field, although Ladd was a great defensive tackle. Huge man. McDaniel distinguished himself on the field by being the only player to feature his first name on his jersey. When he arrived with the Jets in 64, Wahoo really began making a name for himself. Our opening game at Shea Stadium, our public address announcer came to me at halftime and he said, Wahoo's been making so many tackles. What if I said to the crowd, uh, tackle by guess who? I said, go ahead and try it. The big linebacker became a New York favorite. When the public address announcer asked who made the tackle, the fans answered in chorus, Wahoo, Wahoo, Wahoo. Guess who? Wahoo. And the AFL got a kick out of it. I don't think George Hallis, Lombardi, and Roselle would have allowed that type of uh, gimmick by a PA announcer uh, back in the 60s. Well, the Patriots publicized the arrival of a homegrown star. And we're very pleased to announce today the signing of uh, Big Larry Eisenhower, the Boston College boy. In a league of rebels, Eisenhower fit right in. They would call me the wild man. I really was kind of a wild guy. I got such an intensity. It was maniacal. I tell you, one of the greatest things in those days was taking quarterbacks out of games. And in my career, I knocked about 18 quarterbacks out of games. 
Hunting for heads was a popular pastime in the AFL. There were times when offensive backs trying to get out of the backfield, they were almost decapitated. You know, guys would stick their elbows out and, and hit them around the head. Few players knocked more noggins than Raiders defensive end Ben Davidson. In my defense, uh, that was legal, and if you hit a quarterback in the face, there was no penalty for that. Knocked him down, that was a tackle, so uh, life was simpler in the old days. During his playing days, Davidson's motorcycle was his means of escape. I saw the film Easy Rider, and to me, the, the trip on a motorcycle was the thing, not the trip on anything else. It's so nice to get away and go somewhere strange. Pack your bags and get the ticket just for a change. He was 6'7". He was a giant of a guy. He looked ferocious. He looked like a Russian czar or something with that handlebar mustache. I just uh, grew that, and it was no attempt to look menacing. I uh, hope my play was menacing enough. In a sport of heroes, Ben Davidson has made his mark as a villain, parlaying a red mustache on top of a six-foot, eight-inch frame. Davidson has earned the reputation as one of the meanest men in football. If you make a tackle and Ben is not laying next to you, duck. Because here comes Ben. Ben would hit the quarterback while he was getting in the car with his girlfriend after the ball game. That was not a late hit to Ben. And we were penalized a lot. We'd have games where we'd get 200 yards of penalties, and Ben would have 75 or 80 of them. I don't think I'd make it in the NFL today. Fortunately for Davidson, he developed an acting career. A career that began with a fully clothed part in one of the most popular X-rated films of the day. Not great for dialogue and got a certain amount of notoriety from that. The movie turns out to be, you know, the pornographic hit of the, the century. So every week for most of the season, an envelope would come. And in this envelope would be these letters written by people. Most of them were misspelling, calling them a pervert, just a degenerate. You are helping send our youth to drugs and hell. <laughs> Davidson's renegade style was a perfect fit on a franchise that had been transformed by another AFL maverick. Since taking over as coach and general manager in 1963, Al Davis began building the Raiders not only a winning pedigree, but a mystique. Which team, by colors alone, is identifiable around the world? Silver and black, tradition, history, nostalgia, commitment to excellence. All those things are the Raiders. We had the opportunity in 1963 to come here and build the finest organization in professional sports. If I could leave a legacy when it's my time to leave, that uh, people all over would remember that patch and say, wow, they, they were good, they were great, and they dominated. In his first season, Davis inherited a 1-13 team and guided them to a 10-4 finish. His efforts rescued a faltering franchise and gave an identity to the city of Oakland. Prestige-wise, Oakland has always been at least one step, more like two or three steps down below San Francisco. San Francisco was the city, and uh, Oakland was the place where there's no there there. This is Oakland throbbing heart of the Metropolitan East Bay, home of the Oakland Raiders of the American Football League, a team which has, under the direction of general manager and head coach Al Davis, enjoyed such a phenomenal growth that it is now being referred to as the coming organization in professional football. I want you to know that this is your team, and I hope you'll grow with us as we grow. He's a very charismatic guy, and if you work for him or you play for him, you, you want to do good for him. Al Davis has a respect of all the players of the 60s. He did a lot for players. He really did. And we really thought the world of him. Davis soon became a key player within the league itself. 
I think the linchpin was always Lamar Hunt. Without him, none of it happens. His money gave the league the kind of credibility that it needed. But the second most important person in the history of the American Football League was certainly Al Davis for resuscitating the Oakland franchise and keeping the firm tent peg, if you will, driven into the West Coast. But also later when he became the, the AFL's final commissioner, he provided the impetus for the merger of those two leagues. And then he felt he was undercut because Hunt and Tex Schramm from the Cowboys cut a merger deal behind his back. After the merger was announced, Al Davis went back to Oakland almost immediately. I think he felt betrayed. I don't know if that's the word he would use, but a lot of bitterness, a lot of bitterness. At the time, the owners were hoping Al Davis would stay on as assistant commissioner, I believe, to Pete Roselle. Well, Al Davis is not going to be assistant to anyone. Across the bay in San Francisco, the summer of 67 came to be known as the summer of love. Nobody wants to get hurt. Nobody wants to hurt anybody. We would all like to be able to live a simple life, a good life, you know, and like think about moving the whole human race ahead a step or a few steps. <clears throat> and, or half uh, a step. Yeah, or a half a step. In Oakland, the human race took a back seat to Davis's obsession with winning. He had assembled a talented team for his head coach, John Rausch, to a roster that already featured future Hall of Famers Jim Otto and Fred Bolitnikoff, Davis added several new faces who would also find their way to Canton. Linebacker coach John Madden, an all-conference tackle at Cal Poly. 1967 was my first year. That was George Bland's first year. Uh, you know, Willie Brown, it was his first year. Gene Upshaw that year was our number one draft choice. If someone wants an opportunity and wants a chance, Al Davis is the greatest at giving him a chance. I mean, you can talk about the people that he's given an opportunity right here sits one of the biggest people that he ever gave an opportunity to. Another was quarterback Daryl LaMonica, who Davis traded for that offseason. Four years, a backup quarterback at Buffalo. Daryl LaMonica finally won a regular job at Oakland. The result, an AFL title and player of the year honors. LaMonica, the league's top quarterback, threw 30 touchdown passes, leading the Raiders to a 13-1 and record, the best ever in the American Football League. But the player nicknamed the Mad Bomber was only part of the 67 Raiders' success. In the AFL, the stories were always the offenses and the offensive players. The defenses didn't get a lot of respect. Our defense started playing well. It got to be, well, what to give them a name. A defensive unit known as the 11 Angry Men. And someone came up and started calling the 11 Angry Men. In the AFL championship, the 11 Angry Men held the Houston offense to just seven points as the Raiders defeated the Oilers to claim their first and only AFL title. The afternoon belonged to the Raiders and their fans. The final was 40 to 7. Losers of 19 straight games in 1961 and 62, the once pitiful Raiders had become the unquestioned champions of the American Football League. Up next was a trip to the Super Bowl. The setting was the Orange Bowl in Miami for the second annual AFL NFL Championship, which matched the Oakland Raiders with a 13 and 1 record with the Green Bay Packers. From the game's opening play, the Raiders were out of sorts against the defending Super Bowl champions. Oh! Hey, we don't drop a million pace. An offense that averaged over 33 points per game was held to just 14. This can't get nothing going. Roll it, you know what I mean? You have her. Right. I right. have her. You have one on play pass, right? Right. On the play pass? Yeah. LaMonica made one more costly error. Herb Adderley anticipated the play and went for the ball. The Packers turned the game into a rout. You know, I mean, they were a great team, but I, I think we were a lot closer to them than that score. We were so good that year, 
and I thought there were going to be a lot of Super Bowls. I thought that it, that was the beginning of a real dynasty for us. For the second straight year, coach Vince Lombardi received the championship trophy from Commissioner Pete Rozelle. Lombardi had a wonderful performance by a fine football club and a great coach. In February of 1968, Vince Lombardi retired as coach of the Packers, but was quickly under consideration for a new position. Richard Nixon was actually interested in Lombardi as a vice presidential possibility in 1968 until one of his assistants said, well, that's great, except he's a Kennedy Democrat. Instead, Nixon settled for Spiro Agnew. Well, Agnew was the uh, governor of Maryland and Annapolis being the state capital. He was, you know, in Annapolis and played occasionally on the Naval Academy golf course where I caddied during the summer. And it was, you know, notoriously the combination worst golfer, worst tipper uh, combined. So you'd see him come and you didn't want to be the next caddy in line. You know, you're kind of hoping for somebody else. Throughout the 68 campaign, it wasn't golf but football that became the preferred Nixon sports photo op. Nixon was a stone-cold fan going back to the 50s. Vice President Richard Nixon is the number one fan in the sellout crowd. Vice President Nixon is among the jam-packed crowd with eyes on Johnny Unitas, the great Colt quarterback. He was an NFL guy, certainly not an AFL guy. Art Starr, not Joe Namath. We're in the midst of another political campaign in this country, but if there is one thing that is non-political, it's being for Bart Starr tonight. Rightly or wrongly, President Nixon was seen as the establishment. He was the old order. The AFL, in perception, and I think in reality, was the choice of the young. If you were young, you certainly are not going to identify with the old way. You're not going to identify with the establishment. So if we're going to be interested in football, and a lot of us are, then we're going to at least shade it toward the AFL. Not Bart Starr, Joe Namath. Since his rookie year in 1965, Joe Namath had evolved into a pop cultural phenomenon who reflected the changing times. Namath's white shoes and shaggy hair established him as a trendsetter. So did his prodigious arm. And he, he didn't just luckily get it there. He zipped it there at about 30 yards across the field right over the right shoulder. No way the defensive back can get to it. Shut out. I used to challenge him sometimes on a quick route. I'd do a quick out and look back and work out, and i said, say, Joe, you can't hit me quick enough. And he'd take the ball, pat, turn around, and throw it as hard as he could, and right there it was. I'd catch it as I made my turn, but I learned real quick not to do that without the helmet because he might take your ear off. He just delivered the ball so well, I mean, with purpose, I mean, it, almost with an anger. Boom, it was out there, I'm going to complete this, the hell with you. And it was like one of these anti-aircraft guns or something, you know, where you aim this way, then this way, then this way, then this way, and he did that, he was boom, 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 pew. And it was arrogant and, and tough and, and uh, vicious. You know, he'd jam it in there, and, and if a guy intercepted, he'd curse him on the way out and then jam it in there again. Great way to play quarterback, I think. I remember Namath as just the epitome of in-your-face. <laughs> that willingness to be the upstart and proclaim it. I feel I can throw as well or better than anybody. And uh, I think mentally, throwing the football, uh, well, I feel confident I can play better than anybody that's ever played the position. But for all his success on the field, Namath was just as famous for what he did off it. Namath is a superstar and a super swinger. They tabbed him Broadway Joe for his forays into the neon night world of New York City. The cameras were there to take a picture of Joe with two girls, three girls taking pictures of him going in his apartment, taking pictures of the girls coming out early in the morning. I remember Namath saying in Sports Illustrated, I don't date so much, man, as I just, you know, sort of hang around and see what I run into. You know, it's that kind of attitude that people found so off-putting. I'm sure a lot of people get turned off the way I act sometimes. They talk about drinking and conniving around with ladies and stuff. It seems almost un-American to me for a bachelor not to, you know, go around uh, having a drink with a lady now and then. 
And why all of a sudden that's become an evil in me, uh, I don't know, but some people don't like it. Well, you can't please any, everybody. Uh, I'm just uh, <laughs> trying to get along, you know, just, <laughs> just trying to get by. Look at that shot. The uh, NFL stood for the old values, and Joe Namath was seen almost as the Antichrist with his white shoes and his hair flowing behind his helmet. Quarterbacks were supposed to be the last bastion of everything that was right and proper. You know, they were John Wayne on the football field. People just couldn't see the deeper truth that he had just as commanding presence in the huddle as Unitas had. He just had more facial hair. I grew a Fu Manchu out of respect for Joe Namath, I'll have you know it. And, and that picture was never discovered until Jesse Ventura produced it on Meet the Press. He was campaigning in Minnesota, and a friend of mine from college said, here, next time you're with Russell on Meet the Press, pop this picture. And I asked Ventura a very hard question. He said, Tim, I'll answer your question, but explain this. And there I am with a big Fu Manchu, a la Namath. 67, 68, there was a lot of BS going on around with Vietnam, with hair length, with faces, with clothes and all that. To me, people were making a deal out of it, were wrong. They weren't allowing us to be ourselves, to express ourselves and still fit in society in a contributing way. At the time, anybody who embodied youth culture was seen as potentially dangerous. The swinging bachelor quarterback in his white shoes, if you came from a certain point of view, that he was trying to bring down the Republic. And I'm sure that there were people in the Nixon White House who thought that. Later, during the Watergate hearings, it was revealed that the Nixon White House kept an enemies list. The list kept getting longer and longer. One name, though, that nobody could really quite understand was that of Joe Namath, a good quarterback with bad knees. Nobody knew what his political sins were. Maybe he couldn't go to his right. Joe Namath was the only athlete on Richard Nixon's enemies list. I don't have a clue why Joe Namath was on the enemies list, but I wasn't surprised to see him on the list. Because he was so high profile, Namath came to represent the kind of, and I put this in quotation marks, kind of counterculture that President Nixon and those around him saw as a real and present danger to the country. Joe was a Democrat because he came from a union family, but I don't know of any other reason why Joe would be on the list other than the fact that he was thought of as a rebel. If you look at Nixon's feeling about hippies and long-haired people, Joe was a very visible symbol of that flower power hippie generation. You know, it was nice to see somebody out of the mold, but he wasn't really a countercultural hero, per se. Namath was himself by no means uh, politically radical, let alone even particularly liberal. What Joe Namath represented was a countercultural emphasis on hedonism and individualism. And I think through Namath specifically, people began to associate the AFL, you know, with, with something that was, you know, countercultural and adversarial. The Namath issue is, is a profound one, but he was unique. Back then, how many guys had long hair? Hey, you know, Joe Namath did, and we knew that. Were all the players, did they have long hair? No. The league was probably portrayed as being anti-establishment, but we as players certainly didn't feel that way. We knew we were the underdogs, but anti-establishment is not a good brush to paint us with, certainly not. At the time, if people were looking to rebel, they had a lot more options than rooting for the AFL. <laughs> Intense fighting both on the ground, inside the buffer zone, and in the air sends Vietnam casualty figures to a new high. What had been what the military calls a low-intensity war expanded tremendously, got deeper, and by certainly 1967, the public opinion was beginning to swing, if not against the war, seriously questioning the war. Young people across the nation were divided on the issue of military service. The playing fields of pro football were no different. By the late 60s, the war was seen by most of us as a wrong-headed thing, and most young men were trying to avoid being sent to Vietnam. You know, I was among them. Uh, let me have your attention. 
I want you to show by raising your hands whether there's anybody in here that wants this job. I got a job for you. Anybody in here that might want, I'll tell you in a minute, it, uh, it pays about, I'll tell you what it pays, about $175 a month. Uh, this, is, this is fighting the war in Vietnam from a helicopter. Anybody here want that job? Raise your hand. There was one man who accepted that job, Bob Kalsu, an offensive lineman who played just one promising season for the Bills in 1968. I'm sure when he took ROTC, he didn't think of Vietnam or anything like that, but he just said, Jan, I'm no different than anyone else. And he said, you know, when they call me up to go, I'm going to go. Cal Su left his pregnant wife and their infant daughter and joined the 101st Airborne Division as a first lieutenant atop a hill known as Firebase Ripcord. My last letter that I received from him talks about that the North Vietnamese are all around us and we're in heavy mortar area. On July 21st, 1970, an explosion tore through firebase ripcord, killing Lieutenant Kalsu. He is the only player in the history of the AFL to die in the Vietnam War. Now go on to Chicago and let's win there. 1968 remains one of the most explosive years in American history. Sock it to me. When Martin Luther King was shot, and then uh, Bobby Kennedy after that. The predominant sense, as I remember, it was, oh boy, we're in the deep shit now. Things are out of control. Suddenly, uh, we seem to be in the grips of a kind of madness that uh, there was no way to get out of, it seemed. Against this backdrop of convulsive social change, things are starting to change on the football field as well. In 1968, the Chiefs install Willie Lanier as their starting middle linebacker and he becomes the first African-American to start at that position in the history of pro football. Another barrier being broken down. You get the first first round draft pick of a black quarterback, Eldridge Dickey, by the Raiders that same year. You get Marlon Briscoe as a black starting quarterback in the AFL, significantly the AFL at that time. It was a more egalitarian, more racially mixed, more equal opportunity league, if you will, than the NFL was at that particular time. 1968 also marked a breakthrough for what had been the league's most downtrodden franchise. The lowly titans that played before empty stadiums and nearly went bankrupt were now Joe Namath's Jets, the most popular team in the league. I was a huge Jet fan. Uh, you know, my dad's first pro job was with the Jets for eight seasons and the, the Jets on defense with Jerry Philbin and Paul Rochester, Larry Grantham, Al Atkinson, Berlin Biggs, and John Elliott. I mean, I know all these guys, you know, I mean, that's what's so funny about it. I was like six or seven years old, yet I can always remember them. In 1967, the Jets owned one of the league's best defenses. Joe Namath became the first player to throw for over 4,000 yards, but he also threw 28 interceptions, and the team failed to make the playoffs. Joe had to change his ways, and we were all ready now to bring it to management and, and uh, let them know about it, but the, they knew it. They came to the players and they said, look, you got to get Joe elected captain. You got to give him some responsibility. When he gets this responsibility, he'll show that leadership. As soon as he became captain, we named Johnny Sample co-captain on defense, and the rest is history. In 1968, Namath became less of a showman and more of a complete quarterback. He threw for less yards and less touchdowns, but far fewer interceptions, and the Jets won the AFL's Eastern Division.
In November of that season, NBC was on hand for the Jets' highly anticipated meeting with the Raiders. The two best teams in the AFL staged a back-and-forth, high-scoring affair. With 65 seconds left and just before 7 p.m. Eastern time, Jim Turner kicked a field goal to put the Jets ahead 32 to 29. At 7 p.m., NBC was scheduled to air the children's movie, Heidi. And we came up to that magic hour, and I thought, well, I have not been given any countermanding order, so I've got to do what we agreed to do. I was watching the game. It was cut off for NBC to put on Heidi. I, mean, I really thought that they were kidding, that they would maybe say it was Heidi, but then get the game back on. And of course, they never got the game back on. I mean, it was like totally ridiculous. You know, you're begging to hear what's, what happened. And, and, you know, I thought that the Jets won that game. They didn't. Monica to Charlie Smith. Smith is hitting and he scores. The Raiders scored two touchdowns in nine seconds and won 43 to 32. And the Oakland Coliseum became an enormous secret love in called the Heidi Bowl. There were 10,000 phone calls of complaint to New York NBC alone. So many, the telephone switchboards blew out their fuses. NBC apologized for the error, but by then, Oakland had scored two touchdowns in the last minute at beaten New York. The game was over. The fans who missed it could not be consoled. That was the greatest promotion that the AFL ever had was the Heidi game. It was a front page story on the New York Times the next day. New York Times doesn't run sports stories front page unless it's a big thing. And there's a lot of stories then written about that the AFL was much more popular than anybody ever thought it was. And it was. The Jets and Raiders then met six weeks later for the AFL championship. This time not in sunny Oakland, but cold and windy New York. Late in the game, LaMonica and the Raiders trailed by four, but were poised to make another last-minute comeback. But this time, unlike the Heidi Bowl, the Jets' defense and the timely gust of wind stopped the Mad Bomber in his tracks. LaMonica back to pass, looking, throwing a swing pass behind. He threw the ball behind Charlie Smith. It's covered by the Jets. That was a lateral pass. It was not a forward pass. The Jets were headed for the Super Bowl. The NFL representative in the game would be the Baltimore Colts. Some had called the Colts the greatest team ever assembled. They had outscored their opponents by more than 18 points per game and had won the NFL championship game 34-0. Oddsmakers had the Jets as anywhere from a 17 to 22 point underdog. Before Super Bowl III at his annual State of the League press conference, Roselle had mentioned that the league was looking at different playoff formats for the Super Bowl because there was a feeling that it was going to be another decade before the AFL caught up with the NFL. These type of things, when people tell you you're, you can't win and the odds uh, were overwhelming and you heard it all week long, we weren't just playing for ourselves. Uh, when you talk to the players, they were doing it for the AFL. I went over to Gold Ocean Mile, the hotel there over on Miami Beach where the Jets were staying. Uh, Joe was down there and he and I used to play golf all the time and he said, come here, I want you to look at this stuff. And so we went up to the room, looked at some film. He said, Marty, we can beat these guys. I said, yeah, you know, I mean, I'm looking at it. I, what the hell, I wasn't looking at it from the perspective of a coach or an analyst. I'm just, you know, I think you probably can, Joe. And he was absolutely convinced that, that they would win the game. I was at the famous Namath press conference when he guaranteed a victory, and the reporters had gathered around with Namath, and they said to him, Joe, do you think, uh, you think the Jets are going to win? I said, yeah. Are you, you really think the Jets, the lowly AFL who've been whipped in two previous Super Bowls, you think you can beat the mighty Colts? He said, well, that's why I play. Why would I play if I thought I wasn't going to win? Uh, are you saying you're going to win? So you guys have been talking for two weeks now. I said, I'm tired of hearing it. I said, I got news for you. 
We're going to win the game. I guarantee it. It's just out of anger. It was out of frustration. It was my turn to talk, and I was tired of hearing it. That's how the guarantee came out. It was not planned. It wasn't premeditated. It was just anger and frustration. And I really believed we were going to win the game. That story only appeared in the, uh, in the Miami Herald. And I gave the paper to uh, Weeb. I said, Weeb, before we go down there, you better read this. And he read that. And he said, Dad, gummit, Joe, why'd you have to go and do that? We had them right where we wanted them. You think it upsets them? You think they got the clipping on a bulletin board? Well, I don't think it upsets them. If it does, it's uh, ridiculous. I think they're going to be emotionally uh, ready for this game anyway. And if they have to uh, go back and read newspaper clippings to get them up to the game, I think they're in trouble. Well, you've all read and heard all kinds of free game dope during the week. I think one big sidelight has been Joe Namath. Joe Namath, of course, is the man that the Colts have to stop. But Namath has not been bashful this week. And he has said that the Jets are going to win. He doesn't even predict it. He said, I guarantee a Jet victory. I was 19 years old and living in Buffalo, New York. And for the first time, someone by the name of Namath was guaranteeing the uh, AFL was going to win the Super Bowl. I had a friend named Jerry Lombardo who was entered the Jesuits. He was going to be a Jesuit priest. And he was at a novitiate, which is a seminary for trained to become a priest. And I stopped there to watch the football game. The eyes of a nation were on the Orange Bowl. Could Joe Namath make good on his guarantee and avenge the AFL's lopsided losses in the two previous Super Bowls? I was in, at the game and uh, surrounded by NFL people. And all these people were boasting about the Colts and how they were going to slaughter the Jets. The Jets didn't have a chance. There was no way in the world. You know, that Mickey Mouse League, I was kind of slumped down in my seat because, you know, I didn't want to be noticed too much. But as the game progressed, Joe Namath was able to throw some passes. Matt Snell was able to run. And the defense for the Jets doing a superb job against that cold offense. Now, all of a sudden, you know, I'm starting to sit upright in my chair there in my seat at the stadium at the Orange Bowl. Namath, red hot. Everybody thought he'd get killed in this game. He has killed Baltimore so far. That's snell has been the outstanding runner so far. He's in there. Snell scores. I said, oh my God, the, the AFC, AFL's going to win. Broadway Joe is going to deliver on his promise. And suddenly um, they turned the TV off, the head pr priest turned the TV off and said, uh, we are now going into the refectory to have our dinner and we eat in silence. And I looked around, I said, Jerry, come here. You're going to be a priest. <laughs> I'm going to watch the Super Bowl. So I'm in there watching the second half all myself. He may be sitting in one of sports' greatest up there. The Jets, Joe Namath, and the AFL were about to make history. And there was nothing the Colts, Johnny Unitas, or the NFL could do to stop. Intercepted. Andy Beverly downs it. That's the fourth interception by the Jets of the game. In about the fourth quarter, I'd heard all these derogatory things said about the American Football League that I had to stand up and I said, okay. How does the American Football League look now? Very quiet it became in that section of the Orange Bowl. The game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions. They have upset the Baltimore Colts and beat them handily here today. I walked back into the dining room, and there are all these young men looking at me, and they're trying, and I'm... <laughs> and I'm trying to do hand signals, you know, 16 9, you know, Jets. Jet. Finally, he rings the bell and says, Would you please announce the score? I thought I was going to lose a whole generation of Catholic priests who were going to break their vow of silence to find out about Joe Namath. It was a win for the New York Jets and the old New York Titans. It was probably the happiest, most fantastic moment of my life. It was a win for Namath. 
there was such a feeling of elation, joy, tickling explosion inside. We did it! We did it! Yes! 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 Oh, it was great. And it was a win for the American Football League. I'd like to think that this will bring all the football closer together because if this does anything, this will solidify the thinking of the public that football is football, the American League, and the NFL can be mentioned in the same breath. After the game was over, many wanted to share in Joe Namath's triumph. Most wanted to shower the conquering heroes with affection. One group just wanted to say thanks. Lenny Dawson, Otis Taylor, uh, Bobby Bell, all those guys were there at the hotel waiting for us when our bus got back. And uh, they had tears in their eyes. And they would say thank you so very much for winning this game. 11 of us went to the All-Star game. We were playing the West All-Stars, and I was playing against Ron Mix. The first play of the game, when they broke the huddle, he came out and he extended his hand. He says, great job. You made us all happy. The AFL's incredible rise to the top of the pro football world was a difficult one to accept for the National Football League. We were devastated. <laughs> now, the only person more devastated was Carol Rosenblum. They had a reception at his home, anticipating an automatic win. Behind a rubber plant, all you can see was Carol's hairpiece. He never came out from behind the rubber plant. He was so humiliated. NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle had explored keeping the American Football League out of the Super Bowl. Now he was the first from the NFL to embrace the opposing league as an equal and to view the historic events of Super Bowl III from its proper perspective. And Roselle, who was usually a step ahead of most of us, Roselle said, this is the best thing that could happen to us. Pete proved to be right. Super Bowl III was a victory for the Jets, for Namath, and for the American Football League. But above all else, it was a victory for pro football. The two leagues would soon merge as one to become America's game. And the Super Bowl would grow from its humble beginnings to become the most watched one day sporting event in the nation. But none of this would happen just yet. The 60s will be described as a decade in which football became the number one sport in America. Professional football was America's first and best reality show, you know? It had everything, spectacle, fabulous athleticism, violence. Eventually, you moved into another orbit beyond anything anybody would have ever thought. The AFL's long journey to respectability mirrored America's race to the moon. Both were within reach by the end of a tumultuous decade. We find ourselves rich in goods, but ragged in spirit, reaching with magnificent precision for the moon, but falling into raucous discord on Earth. That was a year in which everything had gone wrong. The Tet Offensive in Vietnam, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated, the first campus riots broke out at Columbia. Everything just seemed to be coming apart at the seams. And the one thing that was going right was the space program. Four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Liftoff on Apollo 11. The whole country was fixed on it. Okay, we have our differences, but this, we're in together. Here's something everybody can pull for. We're on the way to the moon. On July 20th, 1969, Apollo 11 achieved the goal set by President Kennedy at the beginning of the decade. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. 
There was no doubt we can do whatever we set our minds to doing was the, was the dominant mindset at the time. Six months earlier, the New York Jets delivered a more earthbound feat, but no less earth-shattering. A historic victory in Super Bowl III. That ball is caught, but this game is over. The New York Jets are the world champions in a stunning upset. They have beaten the Colts handily here today. The Jets beating the Colts in the Super Bowl was more shocking than a man walking on the moon. Uh, I feel like the man walking on the moon, they prepared us for that, okay? Space launches through the 60s, got you ready for that. No one was prepared for the Jets to beat the Colts. It was unthinkable. Can you expect anything like this? You know, New York is used to winners, aren't they? Well, uh, yes, they have been in the past, all the great teams they've had here. And we're just very happy that we were the teams that brought the great... Uh, team here the Jets to the fine fans we have. Could you do it again tomorrow? Well, we think so. Yet the AFL's decade-long search for respect did not end with the Super Bowl. The storyline coming out of Super Bowl three was it was a fluke. A lot of the Colts players said if we play ten times we're gonna win nine of those games. In the eyes of the NFL establishment the AFL was still junior league. Separate, not equal. That's why, with the league speeding toward a 1970 merger, the issue over realignment threatened to tear it all apart. You know, it was like the final stages of an arranged marriage, if you will, and uh, there was a lot of uneasiness. Perhaps one of the most difficult things was for the National Football League to determine what franchises would now join the new American Football Conference, to even out the two conferences. Nobody in the NFL wanted to go join the AFL. You had 16 teams in one league and 10 in the other. You know, it would be sacrilege if the Chicago Bears or the Green Bay Packers or the Los Angeles Rams went. But then Roselle said, you know, we're going to give $3 million to each team that goes. And Carol Rosenblum from the Baltimore Colts, I'll go, you know. So the Colts went first. The next two volunteers were harder to come by. Commissioner Pete Rosell literally sent the owners to the mattresses, forcing a marathon 36-hour meeting which had many sleeping at the league office. Finally, two teams were convinced to move. The rivals Steelers and Browns would join the AFC in a division that featured Paul Brown's Cincinnati Bengals. Well, one of the reasons we came back into football and here in Cincinnati with an American League football team is that we knew that by 1970, by constitution, there will be just one league, the National League, and it must be realigned. And uh, the first thing that is stated there is by geography. And of course, that puts us in the position we won. Paul Brown bought a team in the AFL knowing that there was going to be a merger. He even made the statement, I didn't pay $10 million to be in the AFL. They will take their world of color and excitement into the new Riverfront Stadium where they will meet a new opponent, the Cleveland Browns, in what should become one of the game's great rivalries. I think that you could look and see that division with the Steelers, the Browns, and the former Browns owner, Paul Brown, in Cincinnati as a logical and heated rivalry. So I think it made for good football sense. It was left to the Steelers' Dan Rooney to convince the AFL owners of its logic especially Al Davis, an AFL pioneer and its former commissioner. I said, okay, we're here. You know, I didn't act like I was thrilled. I said, we're here. And I said, this is the division we're going to be in. And Davis immediately, as Davis does, he said, that's not your division. I said, what do you mean it's not our division? He says, we got to sit down and decide what the division is. We've got to debate that. Vince Lombardi grabbed him and threw him up against the wall. I said, listen, if that isn't the division, we're at that door right now. Davis was all right. He, 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 he got to be okay. Realignment left resentment on both sides. There was also a sense that it cost the AFL its identity. I wanted the American Football League to stand on its own, to be the finest league in all of professional sports. The newspapers were filled with comments about you know, how people felt, how the fans felt. There were campaigns, remember the AFL bumper stickers came out of Buffalo. I felt that the, that the leagues could have merged and formed Major League Football, made up of the National Football League and the American Football League. 
Baseball has done that for 100 years. I would have just put every expansion team in the AFL. That would have done my heart good. We, we would, would have had all the expansion teams that could have been looked down on and denigrated and then every, at the end of every year beat the NFL in the Super Bowl. It was clear one Super Bowl win would not be enough. But one player emerged from its glow as football's biggest star. Ladies and gentlemen, Joe Namath. After we won the Super Bowl, people climbed on the car and they climbed on the hood just to see Joe Namath, to wave to him, to touch him. The young girls are screaming at him. And a police officer said to me, said, I haven't seen anything like this since the Beatles. When the Jets landed in Buffalo, at the Buffalo airport, before the first game of the 69th season, there were several hundred Bills fans to greet the Jets. The Jets were our team, and it's not just Buffalo fans. They all felt that way. Players from other teams felt that way. Opponents treated Namath like a conquering hero. He was the focus of female fans and opposing game plans. The big thing this week is going to get to, get to Joe, just like every other week. Got to get to the quarterback. You can't give that guy enough credit, though, you know, playing with two bad knees. and He's the best in the business. <laughs> yeah, let's see. What are we going to do? You, you, you still want to go on the theme of Namath? He was the league. I mean, he became the guy. I mean, he was the poster of the American Football League. He was on billboards and magazine covers, in print ads and pantyhose. Joe Namath in Beauty Mist Pantyhose? Yes, we did it to prove that Beauty Mist can make any legs look like a million dollars. Now, I don't wear pantyhose, but if Beauty Mist can make my legs look good, imagine what they'll do for yours. <laughs> can you tell me some of the other projects specifically that you might be involved in? Well, other than the companies uh, that I work with full time, like Fabergé, or Brute, and uh, Kelvin Clothes, and, and Franklin Sporting Goods, and, and Aero Shirts, and Hamilton <laughs> Beach Popcorn Poppers, and Lazy Boy Chairs, and Dynamic Classics Luggage, other than those jobs, uh, my time is, is my own. You have to keep in mind that this guy was a fabulous football player. Long before he put on the pantyhose, he was taking a terrible beating, and yet he always kept coming back. People respected Namath, but they also knew he had this uh, raffish, theatrical side to him, and he got away with things. If they go double-double, he's still running across, he's yeah, not going to try. I like try. it in there because the middle's open on double-doubles, that's it pretty good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Flank left, 63 seam on one. Ready? Joe Namath was pretty cool. I mean, I didn't mind the hair. I didn't mind the pant. I thought the pantyhose was funny. Uh, I didn't mind him at all. The only bad thing was, you know, he was in the wrong league. For years, Namath and the Jets played in the shadow of their crosstown rivals until they met in the preseason, seven months after the Super Bowl. Now, this was no regular exhibition game. We had two guys that were going to retire Bill Mathis and Larry Grantham that came back just to play in that game. It's one ball game that I would not have missed for my life. It was as important to me as the Super Bowl was because even though we were the world champions in professional football, in New York for several years, people perceived the New York Jets like it's a minor league. Whip him, whip him now, let's whip him. They owned, owned Manhattan, and, and we had to change that. We played them at the elbow in front of like 85,000 people, and we just killed them. Mike Battle, a rookie, had that famous punt return where he hurtled over the Giants punter. And Namath had one of the most brilliant passing days ever. I think he completed something like 16 out of 18 through three touchdown passes. So we won in a big way, and it eventually cost Ali Sherman his job. The Jets took Manhattan. Namath was king of New York, but he ran afoul of the NFL's king of New York that summer. The allegations were that patrons of the nightclub owned by Namath had ties to organized crime. It is responsibility of this office to advise individuals, both players and other club personnel, whenever any of their associations could possibly cause harm to their individual reputations or the game of professional football. 
this office became aware of the backgrounds and habits of certain persons frequenting Bachelors 3, of which Joe Namath is a co-owner. Joe, we have uh, reliable information that undesirable individuals are frequenting your restaurant. And we're asking you, demanding, we want you to sell in 24 hours your interest in the restaurant. I asked him if it made any difference that I didn't have anything to do with anything going wrong. He said, no, it doesn't. He has to do his job, and uh, if I didn't sell, I would be suspended. Well, I, I'm not selling. I quit. This is ridiculous. I felt like I was getting persecuted for something here that wasn't right, man. And uh, I refused to go along with it. We couldn't believe what, what was going on. You know, we didn't know he was going to come back or not come back. Uh, luckily, at the time, uh, he was dating my babysitter, so... <laughs> which is another story, which I won't even go into that one. But uh, she was beautiful, and I found out from her that he really wanted to, you know, come and uh, unretire. But, uh, but we really thought that we had lost him. The tears were real, but the retirement was short-lived. Namath sold his share of the bar and became the bridge to the new NFL. A year later, Broadway Joe would lead pro football into prime time. You want to go to a bar? Are you paying? Are you talking? It's in the player's code. Well, talk to me in code. <laughs> code, will you? Pete Rosell sitting right there. Oh, 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 hi, Pete. <laughs> Joe Namath wasn't the only AFL star with a face for TV. O.J. Simpson got a head start in showbiz at USC. O.J. Yeah. That's what I don't judge for the defense. Uh, lost in space. Star how'd Trek. You, how'd you do? Good. Academy Award. Emmy. Emmy. <laughs> well, certainly uh, O.J. Came, uh, came out of college with enormous charisma. This was the Heisman Trophy winner. He comes out of the West. Legs flashing. Hips snaking. The fast gun. While it wasn't apparent that he was going to become the Hertz commercial or his Hollywood career, it was apparent that this guy was a very special football player. Well, there was a lot of buzz. The juice with that tremendous speed, strong in his shoulders, Go! brought up under the USC kind of thing right there in Hollywood. You know, that guy is a pretty well trained on how to promote themselves. Hey, put that on film. <laughs> Look at it. He was also white friendly, a kind of accessible black figure that Jim Brown, for example, never was. Nothing to it, Jack. <laughs> O.J. didn't bring that edge. At the same time, he brought this enormous talent. Like, a, like an instrument, got to tune it just right, a little at a time. The biggest dichotomy about O.J. is if he lost himself that night and did what he was found not guilty of, but everyone assumes he did, the most puzzling part of it is you can talk to a lot of people who know O.J. I'll tell you some things. One captain of every team he ever played on. Never lost his temper. Never argued with an official. Was team leader everywhere he went. If you played on the Bills and you had a personal problem, you went to OJ. Or two OJs. The first choice in the first round, Buffalo. Buffalo is expected to make their choice in less than the 15 minutes. <laughs> Up until the time I entered junior college, I was a 49er fan. I still am as far as just sentimental reasons, you know, because it's my hometown. But there's a few other teams I like a little better. Who do you like that? I like the Rams quite a bit. Uh, I like the Jets. I like Buffalo. <laughs> I'm going to have to like Buffalo. Nobody can tell you There's only one song worth singing They may try and sell you Cause it hangs them up to see someone like you But you've got to make your own kind of music Sing your own special song Make your own kind of music Even if nobody else sings along 
O.J. Simpson, I, that was my last year, and I'd like to say that he's the reason I retired, <laughs> because I remember he got the ball, and he kind of made one step at me, which froze me a little bit, and then he backtracked, <laughs> and he went all the way around for about a 30, 40-yard game. The speed was phenomenal, and uh, the moves were great. He was something. Jay Simpson, whose only credo was guile and grace and grab a bunch of yards. O.J.'s rookie year was the AFL's last. A glimpse of an icon who became the first player in NFL history to rush for 2,000 yards in a season. Nobody could run the football like O.J. I mean, I still think in his prime, he was probably the best running back that ever played in the NFL. His celebrity has gone different directions since, for sure. In 1969, some 400,000 of the nation's youth traveled to a farm in upstate New York for the biggest pop culture festival in history. A celebration of peace and music and long hair. You wanted freedom, honest expression, freedom to uh, live and be the way you felt. You weren't really breaking a lot of rules or any rules, but people thought you were breaking rules by just simply the way you looked. Through Namath, the AFL had come to represent certain aspects of the counterculture. But overall, the players from the rival leagues were not that different. First of all, we came out of the same kind of colleges that the other guys did and generally were highly disciplined, respectful of authority in a way that's almost incomprehensible today. If you were in high school in the 50s, you remember that many of your coaches were guys who were Marines and Naval officers during the Second World War. These guys had a military discipline to them. There was no uh, flakiness permitted. Was Weeb not the ultimate crew cut guy? I mean, he was. And what about Hank Stram? Come on, come on, do something back there! Oh! Did you see that? Well, shit. Even the AFL's most colorful coach had strict rules regarding hair and dress. 1969, at the height of Woodstock and the age of Aquarius, the first day of training camp, Hank Stram's talking to the team and just says, these are the rules. No sideburns, no facial hair, no mustaches, no hair longer than my own. The word around here is discipline, and there's only one way to teach it. You'll be up at 6.30, you'll be eating by 7. If you miss a meal, it won't come out of your hide, but it will come out of your paycheck. He had a dress code, and you had to have shirt and tie, and you had to wear the black jacket as well as hound's tooth slacks. Because I told him to. Hank's father was in the clothing business, so dressing and looking sharp were always, you know, a big thing to Hank. You know, I mean, his team not only played well, but they looked better coming off the bus and walking through a hotel lobby than any team in pro football history. We were in Boston. Abner Haynes was in the lobby, and the lady comes up and hands, hands him his, her bag, wanted him to take it up to the room. <laughs> Thought he was a bellhop. Uh, he did. He made a couple bucks on the deal, which wasn't too bad at that time. But that was the dress code, and uh, he was strict with that. The same rules applied at home to Team Strand. We sold family with our football team. I know initially they laughed about the uniforms, and they laughed about the facial hair thing, and all the things that we did. But I think they knew that it wasn't anything phony, that it was just a philosophy. Stram wanted uniformity of purpose, not just uniformity. In fact, it was the Chiefs' progressive attitude toward race that helped them become a championship contender. I think it's very important for us to uh, bring everybody into training camp with a very open mind, and this is exactly what we do. We don't particularly care where the boy is from, what color he is what nationality, what anything. We're only concerned about helping our football team win football games, and whoever can best do this will be a member of our squad. When we fielded our starting team my second year with the Chiefs, and I started at outside linebacker, I was one of three white guys 
that played, and we started with eight blacks. You gotta remember the times. That was not the norm by any stretch, but I think Hank Stram, to his undying credit, looked at, at the great minds of, of great football talent that was in a lot of these black schools, especially in the South, and came out with some absolutely tremendous football players. Bobby Bell, one of the great outside linebackers ever. Buck Buchanan from Grambling, 285 pounds. Jim Marsalis, Emmett Thomas, Otis Taylor. These were some of the greatest players in AFL history. Dawson throws a wobbler intended for Taylor, and Otis makes a remarkable catch. Great grab by Taylor. Signing Otis Taylor was a coup for the Chiefs, but they wrote history when they made Willie Lanier the first black middle linebacker in pro football. Middle linebacker, the quarterback on defense, you know, it was, you know, part of this nonsense that black players didn't have the intellectual and leadership skills to do this. Willie Lanier absolutely exploded that. On the double zone, how you want to pound it offset on uh, the double zone? You can move over. I'll move over. You take first, man. Take. Yeah. Well, I got that wingback. Yeah, yeah. All right. All right. When the 60s started, the Washington Redskins still were trying to sign their first black player to go from that to a team that was led by black people. That was monumental and unprecedented. The comradeship, uh, the black-white relationship that we have are, are, I don't think, parallel in, in, in any team. And I, I'm just elated with it. And, and these kind of things build champions and, and keep you champions. And I feel real good about the Chiefs' future. The AFL was a league of opportunity and also a league of innovation. We had people who developed so many new things to the game. It was really a league that was almost the approving grounds for new ideas. Men in motion, shifting, complex formations, those things were not common in the National Football League at the time. In an age when most football coaches are still imitating Vince Lombardi's fundamental approach to the game, Hank Stram, the coach of the Kansas City Chiefs, stands apart as an original thinker. We used the zone defense at that particular time when not many people were using it in professional football. We used a moving pocket when everybody laughed at it because they thought, well, you've got to be a pocket passer to be in pro football. That's a college vehicle of getting the ball down the field. Our philosophy, move in the pocket. Make sure one, one time you roll right, you roll left. This strategy allowed quarterback Len Dawson more time to throw the ball and limited the enemy's pass rush. Many believe that Kansas City offense is the offense of the future in professional football. Our tie-dye formation was a formation whereby we kept the quarterback, tight end, fullback, and tailback all in a row. And then we would shift, and nobody moved until they saw where the tight end went. We were trying to create a moment of indecision. Brown right slot, Leonard. Brown right slot. 51 full pop geo, huh? Hank Stram recognized something that is conventional wisdom today which is anything the offense can do that causes the defense to have to think before it reacts is to the offense's advantage. That's the way, Leonard. Oh, keep giving him a different look. He was always looking at things, new ideas, new schemes. The restaurateurs in the Kansas City area, as soon as he would come in, would run over with the with, uh, paper napkins to put down instead of the cloth ones that he would use because they were more expensive because he would just get to doodling. Football was his life. Stram's other innovations included freeform calisthenics, impossibly short shorts, and language. Ah, oh, you pooped it up there, jeez. You want to poop it through there from here? And then you want to poop, poop from off the next one. There are certain words that I am attracted to. You know, I don't know why. Like I use the word smush. That linebacker's playing soft on the outside. We ought to smush it in there in pretty good shape. Well, where it came from, I don't know. But it's a juicy word. Blue right slot, motion left, 61 toss man with a smush. Blue left slot, 53 pass. With a smush. The what? Smush. However strange, it worked. The 69 Chiefs were the most entertaining team in all of football. 
They called it Hank Stram's Wild West Variety Show, a carnival in full color that fit the wide open style of the AFL. In today's NFL, the West Coast offense is as common as helmets and shoulder pads. Attack horizontally, use the whole field, a short pass is as good as a run. Cuts it upfield, 10-5, touchdown Buffalo! You know, you see that every week. Our football team as well. You know, every team in the league is, is running some version of the West Coast offense. It was an offense showcased in Super Bowl 23 by Bill Walsh and Sam Weish. Back to throw Montana. Stepped up throw. But its roots are in the AFL. In the late 60s, Walsh helped design the system as an assistant under Paul Brown. Sam Weish was one of his quarterbacks. Alternating at quarterback were number 14, Sam Weish, a free agent who functioned like another coach. The team, of course, was the Cincinnati Bengals, who became the AFL's final franchise in 1968. A brochure was prepared pointing out the features of the city and why it was the logical selection for the franchise. All aspects of the area were shown in this brochure, which was excellent. For 17 years, Paul Brown ruled pro football. The only coach ever to have a team bear his name, he built the Cleveland Browns into a football dynasty. And for his contributions to the game, was inducted into pro football's Hall of Fame. To me, that's the father of professional football. Everything that Paul Brown did in the early 60s with the Cleveland Browns, and certainly in the late 60s and 70s with the Bengals, 95% of that is what we do today. From scouting players, to breaking down film, to game planning, to on the field teaching, coaching drills, and so forth. 50 years later, everybody's still basically doing the same thing. I'm quite familiar with Paul Brown, the coach of the Cincinnati Bengals. I played for him for two years with the Cleveland Browns. He has never been a razzle-dazzle coach because when I was there, he had Jimmy Brown, and he just gave the ball to Jimmy Brown, but I don't believe that they have a Jimmy Brown in Cincinnati this year. Ironically, the deficiencies of the expansion Bengals led to the innovation of the West Coast offense. You've got a, you've got a real problem on this. If this man gets any surge back here, the quarterback takes one step back, Harry Gunner with his nine-foot arms. They never had the greatest offensive line of all time, so they had to try to find a way to run the ball without running it. You know, I mean, so it's shorter passing game. They had a quarterback, Virgil Carter, and I don't think he had the strongest arm of all time. So it was more out of necessity that they came up with this. The West Coast offense was born in Cincinnati. Walsh used to tell us, I want the defense to defend every play on every part of the field. Like shallow crosses, get players running across the defense. The fullback swing pass. Roll right, fullback flat. Roll right, fullback flat. Good. And Walsh didn't care if it went for two yards. You made them defend the field way out there. And it bought us as receivers a little more room, a little more space. And we took advantage of that a lot. Two years ago, Trumpy was working as a bill collector in Los Angeles. Today, he's an all pro. The most famous play that the 49ers ever ran on it is that the catch is a is a play that we had that Paul Brown put in. Give him credit for it. Q8 option is called. We're going to call a sprint option. He's going to break up and break into the corner. Okay, you got it. Quarterback has the option to run and throw. We used it a lot. Bill Walsh loved that play, and that was the genesis of the West Coast offense. He throws into the end zone. Touchdown! Touchdown! Holy smoke, Bill. We keep trying that same darn thing, and we keep getting knocked in our pride every time. At times, Brown bristled at the experiments conducted by the young genius, but the West Coast offense was a success. 
the Bengals, from the get-go, they were a team to be reckoned with. In their first home game of the season, the Bengals attacked the Broncos like so much fresh meat on the hook. The Bengals had tasted blood, and they liked it. They were the only team in 1969 to beat both the Chiefs and the Raiders who played in the championship game. In 1969, as in the two years prior, the Chiefs and Raiders were the best teams in the West. It was a natural rivalry. Woo! And a baby! Hey, was that there? Yeah. The same one. <laughs> yes, sir! You had the Kansas City Chiefs, a dapper outfit. They were a team that projected the image that Hank Stram wanted to project. And it was a far different image than the image of Al Davis and later John Madden and the Oakland Raiders. This intimidating, swashbuckling bunch. Come on, Ben, hit him anyway! Come on, Ben, let's go! So that rivalry, in many ways, the defining rivalry of the 10 years of the AFL came out of those terrific contrasts. A lot of players didn't like each other. I mean, let's get right down to it. You know, that was, that, that was back in the days when you could really, I mean, God, you could blast people out there. And they just clothesline you, they hit you out of bounds, they do all that kind of stuff. He is dead. Did he get cleaned by Aaron Brown? It's too bad the game's not like that anymore. Len Dawson seemed to get the worst of it. There's an incident every time we played the Raiders. Their attitude was if they had a chance to take a cheap shot at me, they'd take it. And he's brought down at the 28 yard line. Here's a flag. Gamesmanship extended beyond the field of play. One time on Saturday, I was going by the visiting team locker room in Oakland, and there were some exterminators in there. And, and I said, you know, what's going on? He said, well, we got rats in this locker room. We're getting rid of them. I said, I'll tell you what. I said, take off. Leave the rats there. The rats are good. And if anyone says anything, I'll take responsibility. So now on Sunday... I, I go, and I knock on the chief's door, and I ask for Hank. I said, Hank, I'll tell you, we got, and I say it loudly so the players can hear, but, you know, it was, Hank, let me tell you, we have, we have a little problem in the locker room. We have rats in there. You got rats are in the locker room, but the next time, we're working on it, and the next time you come here, there won't be any more rats, but today you have to live with them. And... Uh, of course, you know, I, I talked to players about that, and, you know, they wouldn't put their feet in the ground. And they were, you know, standing up on the benches, getting dressed, and, and that was a crazy time. In the 69 playoffs, the Chiefs went to New York and beat Joe Namath and the defending champion Jets. Then it was Oakland, home of the Rats, and the rivals who had their number. There was a, a stretch there where the Kansas City Chiefs played the Oakland Raiders and lost seven out of eight games, which was bitter, bitter frustration. So we had to go out there to play them for the right to go to Super Bowl IV. They were so confident that they were going to win that the players had their bags packed for New Orleans because they were going to go right to the airport. In the last AFL championship ever played, the Chiefs finally got the best of the Raiders. He is throwing one deep for Warren Wells. It's intercepted by Emmett Cummins. Back to the 30, to the 40. He may break it. He's at midfield. He's at the 40. That will be the biggest play to date. It makes it so satisfying because as we're going to our bus to go catch a plane back to Kansas City to get ready to go to New Orleans, here come the Raider players with their suitcases in hand that had to walk by us to get to their cars. And I, I'll never forget that. That's the most enjoyable thing that I can recall. I came into the league in 1961. Uh, 
Uh, a lot of our rookies can't remember playing in the polo grounds in front of 2,500 people or uh, Oakland out here in front of uh, as far as 3,000 people. And I've seen the league develop. Uh, there's a lot of pride and prestige and, and uh, uh, really a lot of love for the American Football League. Three, two, one. Both the space race and pro football were marvelously marketed for their times. There was so much that was going on socially that was freeing and unstructured and unorganized and do your own thing. And yet there was a compelling case for these two extremely interdependent, extremely collaborative exercises. One getting a man to the moon, the other one professional football that struck the nation's imagination. That sense of Gene Kranz, the flight director, pacing around at the mission control was, was soon mimicked on the field with head coaches with their heads set up to the booth, walking back and forth, trying to figure out what was going on. Look for 65 toss power trap, what does it look like? Hey, look for our 65 toss power trap, Let's see what it looks like. In a country that was rapidly hurtling forward, both pro football and the space mission were relentlessly modern. Apollo 11 was a mission born of the past. A promise kept to a fallen leader. Once it splashed down, Apollo 12 was on the clock. That mission belonged to the future, to the idea that it isn't enough to do something once. The AFL champion Chiefs were harbingers of another future. The history of their league was coming to an end, yet it would be defined by their performance in Super Bowl IV the last game before the two leagues merged. After the Chiefs knock off the Raiders in the last AFL championship game, they head down to New Orleans and they're installed as 13-point underdogs. And George Blanda of the Raiders made a comment. They're doing it again. They're, they're taking the AFL for granted. They're not giving the AFL the respect it deserves. The Chiefs knew the sting of disrespect all too well. They had felt it ever since losing the first Super Bowl to Vince Lombardi and the NFL's Green Bay Packers. I think the Kansas City team is a real top football team. It doesn't compare with the National Football League team. That's what you want me to say, I said it. <laughs> that irritated us, and that, that, that stuck with us until we had another opportunity to get back to a Super Bowl. The fourth Super Bowl Sunday was filled with omens and symbols. Five years earlier, the AFL had pulled its all-star game out of a segregated New Orleans. Now the league was back in the form of the Chiefs, who had a chance to be the first world champions in pro football history, with more black starters than white. Honoring AFL history was none other than NFL Commissioner Pete Rozelle. For a decade, the AFL was a league which belonged to its fans, and Rozelle adopted the idea of one of its biggest. 1969 was the 50th anniversary of the National Football League. Every team in the National Football League had a shoulder patch that said 50 NFL knowing that 1969 was the last year of the American Football League, I started writing letters to owners early, asking them to put an AFL patch on the AFL teams. The end of the season came around, I received a letter from Jack Kemp uh, with a copy of a letter to Pete Rozelle, thanking Rozelle for seeing that a patch would be worn. So when I saw them come out with that patch, I was thrilled. The Vikings had their 50 NFL patch on, and the, and the Chiefs had this 10 AFL patch on. We didn't know they were going to do that. We were concerned about the Minnesota Vikings. Now we realize, hey, that's right, 10 years. We're in this thing, and we're going to be representing the American Football League for the last time. In its fourth year, the Super Bowl was more and more a creature of the AFL. It was a spectacle. 
Specifically, it was a reenactment of the Battle of New Orleans, an American victory, at least the first time. The most ominous sign for the National Football League was that its part of the show never really got off the ground. I'd see this Viking going along, and he was jumping in and out of this hot air balloon. And then I understood that the hot air balloon was supposed to be going up. It was kind of a mass confusion on the field. The uh, hot air balloon didn't have enough hot air in it or lost its hot air or something. The Vikings gondola started to bounce along in towards some of the seating at the part of the end zone. Maybe that was a, a coincidence that things were not going to go well for the Vikings that day. What the balloon lacked in hot air was more than made up for by Hank Stram. How in the world can all six of you miss a play like that? All six of you miss a play. Mr. Official, let me ask you something. How can six of you miss a play like that, huh? All six of you. The ball jumped out of there as soon as we made contact. I thought you were talking about you being on the field. No. What? Stram's Chiefs built a nine to nothing lead, and the manner in which they did it proved their offense was in another league. Even their shift out of the I formation caught the anxious Viking line offside. In Super Bowl IV, the Chiefs, with their offense of the 70s, all their multiple sets, all their man in motion, all their shifts, were doing things that, that frankly confused the Vikings. Yeah, Kosalki was running around there like it was a Chinese fire drill. They didn't know where Mike was. Oh, he didn't know where he was. They looked like they're flat as hell. Gloucester, tell him 65 toss power trap. Get in there for 65 toss power trap. 65 toss power trap. That might pop wide open, Rats. Running play coming to Garrett on a trap. Touchdown! Garrett scores for the ball. leading now 16 to nothing, and they got to overcome that against our defense? No way. The Vikings did not put a single man in motion the entire game. They didn't have a single pre-snap shift in their offense the entire game. And they weren't even trying to disguise it. It was sort of a point of pride with them to let you know where they were going, and they thought they could succeed anyway. And so at halftime, Bud Grant just told the Vikings, go out and play better. Joe Cap, the big, strong quarterback, looked like he needed a trip to the emergency room after that game. Put your hand over your heart, and you can feel it pound out. What a moment for all of the Kansas City Chiefs. Watch a play-action pass, and make sure you keep them in that pocket. They're beating the best that the NFL has to offer out here today. That ball looked like it had helium in it. You can't float those balls in our league. That's right. Come on, Lenny. Pump it in there, baby. Just keep it trickling the ball down the field, boys. Off the post sideline pattern. Taylor. Taylor, once a symbol of the two leagues' war over players, sealed the AFL's final victory. after Apollo 12 proved man could go back to the moon, the Kansas City Chiefs planted an AFL flag atop the football world. We're so proud and we were 13-point underdogs. We won. 
we ended up the AFL with, with a great flourish. And I think those of us that have been around for nine or ten years in the AFL and have been bad mouthed and uh, look down on uh, take a special pleasure in this game. It's, it's unbelievable. Somebody said, uh, Come on in here, you got to call him the president. I said, President of what? He said, President of the United States. I said, You're kidding me. And it was President Nixon. The AFL finally earns the respect it has so long desired. And the irony, of course, is it earns that respect at the moment it ceases to exist. Lamar Hunt spent a decade putting the league he founded before the franchise he owned. This was his reward. Could I get your reaction, uh, Lamar Hunt? As you look back to those other years, some 10 years ago, there must be quite a reaction. Uh, it's pretty fantastic. It's a beautiful trophy, and it really is a satisfying conclusion to the 10 years of the American Football League. And Lamar Hunt must have felt about as good as a team owner could feel after that game. To see him in the locker room at Old Tulane Stadium after Super Bowl IV is to see somebody who's whose dream has come true, and it's much better than even he could have dreamed of. We're very proud of the recognition that we established as champions of the world of professional football, and we sincerely think that you people here are the super fans of pro football. Thank you very much. The greatest day in the history of Kansas City. This team is the greatest in the universe. Good evening, everyone. From Gillette Stadium in Foxborough, this is Gil Santos along with Gino Capaletti. It's time for the National Football League season opener for the Patriots. Fifty years after the American Football League was founded, both teams wearing throwback legacy uniforms. Gino, you got to make you feel good to know that you wore that uniform for the first time in 1960 for the first game the Patriots ever played. And now 50 years later, here we all are. It just really does bring me back, and it's uh, an exciting thing for the National Football League to recognize exactly what the AFL meant to the success of professional football. After Super Bowl IV, the Chiefs returned to their locker room members of a new NFL. Two weeks before the start of the 1970 season, the embodiment of the old NFL passed away. Lombardi, even though he was feared by a lot of AFL perennials, was also revered. They understood that Lombardi was a great coach. Lamar Hunt sent a note to Roselle suggesting that it would be a good idea to name the Super Bowl trophy in Lombardi's memory. The two rival leagues were embracing each other's past and forging a new future, shoulder to shoulder. Raise your right hand, repeat after me. I, I, Len Dawson, I, Joe Cap, have switched to Gillette Platinum Plus Blades, have switched, switched to Gillette, Gillette Platinum, Platinum Plus, Plus Blades. Blades, because they shave closer and with more comfort. Well, I can only speak for Gillette Platinum Plus Injector Blades. That's true for double edge, too. Take my word for it. Why should I? Hey, come on, guys. This new NFL was about to become more of a pop culture powerhouse than either league was before. I'm right. I'm right. You're both right, right? Right. Pete Rozelle, Tex Schramm, Lamar Hunt, they had this missionary zeal about bringing the game to as many people as possible. And after the merger, one of the great themes of the next decade was Monday Night Football. in professional football meet for the first time ever as members of the new American Football Conference of the National Football League. We had an average of 60 million households watching primetime NFL football, which was unheard of. One of the teams playing in that first Monday night game was a classic AFL team with a gunslinger named Namath. Without the merger, I don't know whether or not the game would have been exciting enough to have been the instant hit it was. Lamar Hunt and his brave cohorts way back when deserve an enormous share of the credit for that. The door that they kicked open culminates with Monday Night Football and the enshrinement of uh, football as America's national game. 
We started, we hung in there, we merged, and now look at us. The appetite is so great that you can build a stadium for over a billion dollars and fill it and make money on it. Today, glittering structures of glass and steel are monuments to a war which left both leagues victors, a war which some continued to fight. I'll never forget in that perfect year I was doing the Dolphins locker room interviews. We were underdogs. This was still how the AFL was regarded. We're unbeaten in the AFC. The Redskins have lost two or three games. We're playing them and they're favored. I drove with Jimmy Greek from Las Vegas to L.A. And, I, and Jimmy set the line. I said, Jimmy, how could the Redskins be favored? We're unbeaten. He said, yeah, you're the AFL. You're still the AFL. I said, yeah, but we had Namath. You're still the AFL. Redskins played tougher competition. I said, you're making a mistake. We dominated that game. For one-time members of the AFL, the road is the same as it was before the merger. Just win, baby. Al Davis remains a true believer. The Raiders won three Super Bowls in the late 70s and early 80s, and each championship ring is a tiny monument to the AFL. Davis's defiant message is as clear as the big A emblazoned on Raider rings. Might have a tattoo on his butt, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, he's an AFL guy, and it's important to him. What finger does he have that ring on? Does he have it on his middle finger? I don't know. Maybe that's his way of saying, you know, F you or something <laughs> to, to the rest of the football world. You know, that was our tradition. We were the AFL. We can't forget our neighborhoods. We can't forget our high schools. And if you started in the AFL, you can't forget the AFL. In all my years as a head coach and in the Super Bowls with the Patriots, Lamar Hunt has always said to me, like, either before the game or after we won, something along the lines of, you got to win this one for the AFL. This has got to be an AFL win. Or, congratulations on the Super Bowl. You know I was pulling for you. AFL. Lamar Hunt passed away in 2006. But his dream lives on in the players, coaches, and fans of the American Football League and all who've since followed. Without a doubt, you know, it was a huge season. Come on, 58, get on that tight end. Damn, go get him! He's more famous for the Bears as being a defensive coordinator, and they were, what, 18 and 1, and had probably the best defense in the history of the game, yet he still wears that jet ring. To this day, that's the only ring he wears. If it weren't for the AFL, you don't know what would have happened to you. I mean, what, what, what opportunities would I have had to coach? Every time I saw Lamar Hunt, I thanked him. Lamar, you know, he got it going, and I got all the guys behind it. Somewhere down the line, I'd been able to write or say hello to each one of them and say thank you. In a time of change, the AFL embraced a new way of doing things, rooted in the oldest of American values. It gave players and dreamers a fighting chance at a life in pro football. Black and white didn't matter nearly as much as ability and commitment. AFL football became more than a game. In a decade when we were sometimes at our worst, we looked at the American Football League and saw ourselves our best selves. The 60s, there'll never be a decade like the 60s. Never, in any area of our life. War, space, assassinations, and the AFL was there. Unbelievable. Came to life in 1960 with the birth of the American football.
football league. Damn beside him, Jack. I got news for you. We're going to win the game, I guarantee. This has got to be one of the greatest football games I've ever seen, Paul. Never club winner, Nick. This is the story of a love affair. The story of the Denver Broncos and their days in the American Football League. You can get it done. You can get it done. What's more, you gotta get it done.